I would like to call to order the February 26th regular meeting and listening session on tiny homes of the Housing Advisory Board. And if we can do roll call. Secretary Palmos, present. Judy Knob. Jacques Chirion. Juliette Boone. Mason Moyer. Dave Ensign. Okay, that's us. Um, the agenda review, I just want to go through briefly for everybody in the audience and give you a little bit of an outline of what we're going to be doing and how we'll be structured here so you know what's happening. Um, we're going to start with a brief public comment just for open comment. That open comment is if you have something other than tiny homes. Okay, so if there's some comment you want for the Housing Advisory Board that's not to do with tiny homes, that little open comment period will be for you. And then we'll go into the presentation. We're gonna have four presentations. Um, one is a short video, uh, and then we have three speakers here, one city staff member and two other guest speakers who've come in. We'll go through those presentations. About 10 minutes each is what we're trying to achieve with those, and after that, we'll recreate our circle, and then we'll come down into the listening session. Now, we may not have chairs for everyone in the circle, but you're welcome to sit in the chairs, the regular seats back behind, and if you want to speak, you can ask to come into the circle, we'll make a space for you. It'll be a fairly um, casual environment, okay? Uh, so with that, Corey, do we need do we need to have Danny? Danny, can you state that you're here with us? <laughs> Anti Doro present. <laughs> Thank you. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and and start the the open comment for public participation. We didn't have anybody sign up for that portion. Nope. Okay, great. So we will close open comment for that, and we'll go right into the tiny homes listening session. Um, so Jay, can you cue up this video? And I'm gonna just prep it a little bit. This gentleman who's gonna be speaking is presenting to the San Diego City Council as they were considering um, an ordinance around tiny homes. And he, his name is Daniel Fitzpatrick. He is, I believe, the president, if I'm correct, Byron, you could probably, um, of the American Tiny Homes Association. Sorry, Tiny Home Industry Association. Um, and so we have just a six minute clip of him giving his presentation. It's a nice little overview. He is also part of the American Tiny Home Association. Okay. So, so Jacques, you, you also want to provide a quick overview of sort of what the purpose of the listening session is and what we hope to get out of it. Absolutely, thanks for reminding me. Um, yeah, so that, that would be good. Uh, uh, what we're trying to achieve, I think, tonight is a, a few different things. Uh, we know that the city council has an interest in tiny homes. We know the community has an interest in tiny homes. We're trying to give feedback to council eventually from the board. And what we try to achieve tonight, I think, is have a community discussion um, first around what tiny homes are, how we classify them, what do we call a tiny home, because there are different definitions. Some people consider certain things tiny homes and other people don't consider those same thing tiny homes. So there's kind of an educational component to it that we're trying to do. Part of that has to do with where we are with the city and um, in that process of considering tiny homes. Um, so there will be some of that and that's kind of what our presentations are more about um, to give us a kind of a context for the tiny home and Boulder. Um, Beyond that, what we're really looking to do here is gain perspective from you community members and people who have been involved with tiny homes and living in tiny homes potentially to start to engage with pros and cons of different types of tiny homes um, and even into the zoning potentially of, well, where would we want as a community to see them? How could we use them? What members of our community, what populations could they serve as an affordable housing issue? Anything I'm missing in there? You no, think? That's good enough, okay. Um, so we will start with this video then. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Ward and members of the Select Committee. I'm Dan Fitzpatrick. I'm the uh, Director of Government Affairs and Advocacy for the American Tiny House Association. Uh, I became involved with uh, uh, tiny homes and uh, the tiny home movement, not because I live in a tiny home or even aspire to live in a tiny home, is because uh, in 30 years as a government official, being a uh, whether it be a uh, county administrator, city manager, redevelopment director, or 20 years as a private developer. One of the most difficult things it is for us to create in the municipal or even in the private sector is affordable housing. And so when I uh, became involved with the uh, tiny movement, I saw this as my niche, my tiny niche, of uh, a way of supporting and working with my friends up and down the state and local government uh, to uh, give them ideas on how to utilize uh, tiny houses, whether stick build or movable tiny houses, uh, in, in terms of meeting their uh, issues relative to affordable housing. My, uh, the staff asked me to cover three things in 10 minutes, so I'm gonna talk quick. One is, what are tiny homes? Two, tiny homes in terms of uh, being used as accessory dwelling units. And three, uh, tiny homes or movable tiny homes in, in uh, the utilization for infill uh, you know, properties, whether it be remnant properties, uh, uh, city-owned properties, or whatever, for uh, affordable housing. First of all, what is a tiny house? And tiny houses are basically now defined legally in the new 2018 uh, International Residential Code as being, you know, homes less than 400 square feet. In general, as you may know, in uh, California law, uh, efficiency apartments are 150 square feet, you know, plus. So that's basically your range of quote unquote tiny homes. And so tiny homes can range anything from stick built, movable, uh, we even have a number of stackable uh, you know, units. Uh, I think Michael was talking about some of the things that can be done in the uh, uh, private sector using factory built uh, components that you can uh, uh, stack. And a number of these are, I know are being built in the Bay Area. I don't know if you have uh, these in uh, San Diego at this point in time. In terms of what is a movable tiny house, they're generally, generally eight and a half feet wide. If you're buying one that you want to move regularly up and down the highways of the state of California or nationally, it can't exceed eight and a half inches wide. And none of them can be over 13 and a half feet tall, right? So they're always under 14 feet, which is normally your limitations for second story and your <coughs> various codes. Um, but many of the movable tiny houses that are only being moved occasionally, they're moved mainly from the factory to the lot, uh, and maybe you know moved every five years or so. Uh, they're being bought. They're being bought up to 10 feet uh, wide. So that's what a movable. I mean, a tiny house is. And as I said, it's a range. It, we also support you know containers and other types of uh, uh, building that's 400 square feet or less. Now, what are movable tiny houses? Movable tiny houses are not your conventional RV. In fact, if you write an ordinance to define movable tiny houses, I can show you 100 different ways of writing it in such a way that none of these will ever be considered a movable tiny uh, you know, house. Movable tiny houses are built to resemble a typical cottage or bungalow. And these are typical uh, pictures of uh, units that are located in different areas in uh, California. They're basically a <coughs> You go to the next slide, a stick built house, the foundation just happens to be on a chassis versus on a concrete you know, slab or foundation. Built with the same two by four you know, wood or steel uh, construction, uh, all of the support, the plumbing, uh, electrical and so forth, uh, built in accordance with uh, code. Uh, you can have many different designs uh, depending on uh, the particular neighborhood in which it uh, plans to go, that you can put any type of facade uh, you want on these particular units. Uh, and certainly the interiors are uh, designed to meet uh, all of your requirements for habitation, for living, sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. Key words right out of the health and safety you know, code for a habitable dwelling uh, unit. 
In fact, these units are actually built stronger than a stick-built house because they're made to be able to go 70 miles an hour down the freeway, you know, and hit a, you know, pothole. And if you look at the interiors here, you will find no drywall. You can imagine what a pothole would do with drywall or plaster on the interior. They're all very well built, so you've got basically your sheathing on both sides is, you know, wood or whatever holding uh, uh, it together. A movable tiny house is one thing uh, that's, you know, people say, you know, why not a stick built, you know, ADU or, you know, versus a movable. Well, many people have, you know, want the flexibility. They may only need it for five or, you know, six or seven years in, in their uh, backyard as an ADU. Uh, you know, many of them are truly being used as granny flats or caregiver facilities or to put a family member through uh, 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 college or, uh, a family member or friend comes back from overseas tour needs to get their life together. It's a perfect, you know, uh, way of doing that very uh, quickly and uh, conveniently. One of the quick items I'll go through affordable. Yeah, I just had Jay stop there. There's more to it, but I think that just set kind of the stage a little bit. And then Jay. I'd like to turn it over to you and give us kind of the the view of the city and where we're at with the city and, and tiny houses. Great. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Jay Stugnitz. I am a planner with the city of Boulder, Housing and Human Services. I want to start off by saying that I am not an expert on tiny homes, far from it. Um, but what I'm going to try to do is share sort of what I've what I've learned from the city's perspective. Um, and this is also an opportunity for the city to learn as well from the community. So I just want to be clear about that. So if I say something that you completely disagree with, let me know. Um, so I just wanted to be clear, this is a little hard to read, but this is from back in 2013. So tiny homes were identified as a potential tool to address some of Boulder's affordable housing challenges. Um, I know it's been talked about ever since I've been at the city. It's also been on city council's work plan for a number of years. Uh, it never quite rose to the top, um, wasn't prioritized, um, but it's always sort of percolated um, just below the surface. So I wanted to get into a little bit more detail on what is a tiny home. So the movable tiny home or the tiny home on wheels, there's even a broader spectrum. So it's everything from something that you would take on the highway to something that's even on casters. So some communities have looked at um, as a potential solution for, um, instead of a shopping cart, to have something a little bit more secure for a pl safe place to sleep and store um, personal items. Um, and that's the image on the bottom there. And then it's more of the traditional that you would think about as sort of the tiny home on a fixed foundation, um, something that could be, uh, you know, on a single parcel out in the country or on an individual lot, but in the Boulder context, Mostly what you're going to see is um, a tiny home is an accessory dwelling unit. So Boulder just uh, back in 2018 relaxed significantly the accessory dwelling unit regulations in the city. Um, and with a, the update to the um, city's building code that I'll talk about in a little bit, it makes it much easier to build these. And that's so from our perspective, we see that is where um, uh, the most likelihood of seeing tiny homes in Boulder in the foreseeable future. Um, so another big question that I think is important to ask is who are we trying to serve with the buy a tiny home? Um, a lot of one option is it's a, sort of this transitional housing. So one step from uh, living on the street. So people maybe who have uh, mental or addiction issues or potentially both who are not quite ready for permanent housing. Um, this has been used as a solution in other communities. Up north, uh, up the picture on top is sort of this where residents uh, build these themselves. And then there's a much more intentional approach, and you, you're going to hear about that. Um, sorry, I borrowed your picture. I hope you don't mind. I forgot to ask your permission first. Um, and then uh, the traditional housing. So it could be rental housing. So that ADU example I gave you is always going to be um, a rental because it's uh, on a single family, uh, uh, single family zoned parcel. Um, and then it, it is potential for a lower cost home ownership opportunity. I mean, it's definitely a 400 square foot home is significantly less than a 4,000. 
Um, but typically the cost per square footage is, is quite a bit higher. Uh, so that's why I had the question marks. And then these slides get into the regulatory piece and I borrowed these, I wanna be really clear, from Don Elliott, who is a planner with uh, Clarion Associates here in Denver. He's given a number of presentations on tiny homes and the regulatory arena around them. Um, and I think this, just really wanted to get the point across, even though they're not RVs, tiny homes, are for the most part regulated just like they would be RVs. So like the speaker said, it has a lot to do with are they safe to move on the highway, not are they safe to live in. So that's one way to do it. The other is if it's on a, a, on a fixed foundation, then it has to meet the building code. Um, and there are a number of layers in addition to the building code. So the building code is all about what is that structure safe to live in. Zoning regulations talk about, well, where can it be built? Um, are there certain, is it residential, non-residential, multifamily or not? What are the setbacks? All those regulations, that's part of the zoning. And then subdivision regulations have more to do with whether or not you could be able to um, subdivide and potentially sell that tiny home. Um, and in the Boulder example currently, uh, if you build an accessory dwelling unit in your backyard, you are not allowed to condoize that and sell it off separately. It has, it's always associated with the primary residence. And then of course there are private covenants, um, and Don says we can ignore it, so I'm not gonna talk about it a lot. But basically if there's a covenant on that um, piece of property that prohibits this type of um, use or structure, then you're, it's gonna cause problems. Um, Again, the building code, is it, is it safe to live in? And it's, um, and it has to do with, are people gonna be living in there for 30 days or more? Um, so that's sort of the trigger of whether or not um, wanna make sure it's a safe uh, um, environment to be in. And so it has to meet either the international or residential code um, or comparable state or local regulation, or it has to meet the HUD standards for manufactured homes. And there's a lot more detail that we could get into with those. Um, but I just want to be clear, many of the tiny homes currently do not meet either of those. Um, and then my last piece is just to talk about what happened at city council recently. I just want to be super clear. So with the city on a regular basis updates our building code to match the international residential code. Um, and this year, it just happened to include standards for tiny homes, which is great. Um, but that was not the intent of the update. I just want to be clear about that. Um, so it is less restrictive, so it allows tiny homes to um, be built, um, and it has to do with stair geometry, the loft, that loft area, allowing a slightly higher ceiling height, as well as a loft egress window for um, safety and um, fire egress. Um, but Boulder was very clear that, uh, our council was very clear in terms of requiring tiny homes to be set on a, on a fixed foundation um, and also to be connected to utilities. So some things to consider. Um, tiny homes really in Boulder are, are considered just like single, detached single family homes. So it doesn't matter if it's 400 square feet or 4,000 or 8,000, it's treated the same. Um, it, if you were to build a tiny home, you would still have to be provide 25% of um, as a community benefit in terms of affordable housing, um, which adds to the cost. And I think what, as I said earlier, I think one of the most likely scenarios is you're gonna see more um, a private property owner building or bringing in a tiny home um, as an accessory dwelling unit. So that's just the quick overlay just, or overview. Any questions or anything? Uh, did I offend anyone? Say something wrong? I I have questions. So. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, well, I guess we can start out with. I feel like there needs to be some clarity, especially if anybody's here. Um, when you say under things to consider, tiny homes are subject to inclusionary housing ordinance. I think what you're talking about is a chunk of land developed as a tiny house community, correct? Or are you just saying one tiny house, so a single family home? Okay, so you're just talking about- Regulated the same as a big house. Okay, just wanna make sure that we're on the same page of whether or not you're talking about a chunk of land or not. Yep. Um, and again, what I got asked a lot of questions for was after the last city council meeting and the headline read, tiny houses are now legal in Boulder, and that was um, perpetuated by 
you know, some misinformation out there. Are tiny houses legal in Boulder? As an accessory dwelling unit, yes. Mm -hmm. And in other situations, um, but it would be really a site-by-site -site mm -hmm. determination that would need to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that the ADU law was relaxed significantly. And I'm curious, um, how many applications have we gotten on ADUs? And what is the percentage um, that increased our overall housing inventory? So I wouldn't know what the percentage is. We've received, I believe, approximately over 150 applications mm -hmm. in the first year. Um, all the, you know, they're in various stages of approval. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you exactly how many have been approved. And um, with complete build out of mm -hmm. the saturation limits that we have, I think the overall was estimated to be one half of 1% of our entire housing inventory, correct? Yep. So with a full complete build out of ADUs um, and we those significantly relaxed rules, we're still only looking at one half of 1% of our entire housing population. When I say significant, I'm talking about compared to what it was before. Oh, yes. <laughs> After 10 years of piloting, yes, yes, okay. Um, you also mentioned that ADUs on slabs, when, we, when you're under, um, who does it serve? Mm -hmm. So you uh, mentioned ADUs on slabs as um, a part of the housing, and one of the discussions you and I have, just for full disclosure, is um, one of the considerations about discussing and entering the conversation of tiny houses on trailers is to build equity. So when we talk housing mobility and um, entering in individuals who already own their homes and create communities versus just creating more renters, um, so would that serve another population? Is there a pop, I guess the question is, is there a possibility to serve more than just the two types being renters and um, uh, creating more renters and communities. Well, th this slide also had homeowners, mm -hmm. homeownership as a potential. Um, homeownerships if you own the main if, house. Well, no, no, so that's always going to be a rental. If it's mm -hmm. an ADU, it's always going to be a rental right. because you have a primary residence, it needs to be owner occupied and then they can rent out the accessory unit. Or they could live in the accessory unit and rent out the main house. Right, but you have to um, own that house. You have to own it. Right. So. You have to own a piece of land. Yep. So it's the same issue with manufactured housing, right? Mm -hmm. So you may pay rent for your pad, you own the home, um, but the challenge is a lot of the times the loans that you get are not favorable because they're considered chattel as opposed to a home ownership loan. So you don't get all the great tax advantages that we bestow on home ownership in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple more, but I think there'll be more down there. Down below. Yeah. I have just one. Could you refresh my memory? Was it the current city council who did this, or was it the previous city did council? Did which? The, who, the who, building code who, update? Who, who loosened the... Uh, I, th I believe the final reading was just last night. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks. Dan? So... When you said, uh, sorry, when you said uh, ownership, so, but you said that, that uh, we, already, we already made a decision that you can't condominiumize one of those, and so it's, it's essentially, it runs, uh, it runs with, the, uh, with the main home in perpetuity, right? So if it's an ADU. If it's an ADU, right. So what kind of scenarios have we contemplated in terms of ownership uh, of the tiny home without having some other property interest. No. Me personally? Or the, the city. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, I would say it has not really been contemplated okay. as a housing type. Um, I mean, the challenge is, yes, you can build, uh, if you own a piece of land, you can build a tiny house and we'll regulate it just the, like we would a regular big house. Um, so the question is, if you own the land, and you can build a tiny house versus a larger house, what are the economics that go into that? Right, right. Unless you can build multiple tiny homes. Unless you, exactly. And condominiumize them or, or even plat them, most likely. Or the other piece is that if we allow tiny houses on trailers, you then have a homeowner who then is essentially cooperatively using land with a homeowner 
a landowner. Um, and so then instead of creating more renters, you're creating a community with homeowners. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think, if I want, yeah, I, I think I want to make one point. I think that these are, and for everybody here, I think these are some of the things that we want to engage with tonight. Mm -hmm. And so we want to set the groundwork here of where the city is right now and understand where else we could go with this. In other words, is this serving us to the fullest extent, extent possible or can we go further? Um, did you have something that you want to add? I want to kind of wrap this up so we can get through our speakers, but go ahead if you want to. You good? I had one quick slide. Okay. Last slide. So what I, what I would suggest might be helpful for everybody is to think about when you say tiny home, what do you, what do you mean? Because I think my, ex my experience is everybody in this room probably has a very, not a very different, but a distinctly different impression about what a tiny home is. So, you know, so as you're talking about it, is it on wheels? Is it on a fixed foundation? Very different scenario. Is it connected to utilities or not? Um, is it in someone's backyard? Or is it in a village like we've been talking about? And really importantly, who is being served and how is it being perceived as a solution to affordable housing? So I don't, that was my attempt at trying to provide a little bit of context and structure. But Great. Move on. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Um, Corey, Jay, is it best if we ask the speakers to come up and sit next to you? Yeah. I think, okay. Um, so Jan, could you join us? Um, this is Jan Burton, who was in the past a city council member and is now um, working on building modular, if I'm correct. I'll let you actually explain what you're doing and then, and then um, talk a little bit about the environment around constructing these. Okay, super, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jan Burton and um, I'm a Boulder resident and I'm also owner of a company called Rhino Cubed, which um, we began making quote unquote tiny homes in uh, January 1 of 2014. So more than six years now. Um, I say quote unquote because everyone has a different definition of what a tiny home was. In fact, our company has always built to IRC standards. And again, as Jay described, IRC is the International Residential Code, which is used in cities like Boulder for housing. So, um, and so they would not be on wheels, not on a chassis. And that was the traditional word for tiny homes. Um, so I just want to tell you that I'm not going to be a big, huge rah-rah cheerleader for tiny homes. I think it's more my, um, my bent as a resident of Boulder and a former council member to talk about the pros and the cons and where I see them fitting, as well as maybe providing some advice of how I think the Housing Advisory Board and this community can make a bigger impact in housing with um, some other policies that I think are more hurtful that unless we change, we'll never really make progress with small homes. Yeah. So the tiny home movement started um, really back in hippie days um, with the original inspiration being uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden. There was a book that was published in the, in the, in the 90s uh, by a woman named Sarah Susanka, who, who is really viewed as, as the person who started talking about the not so big house. And then a guy named Jay Schaefer, who I have uh, been on talks with, uh, offered the first building plans for tiny homes on wheels. Um, then the tiny momentum started with the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. So many, many people who got shoved out of the housing market decided, well, I could do this. I could build this on my own. And why not? So it was a desire for uh, no mortgage, for smaller fees. In fact, if you look at the ownership of, of small homes across the country, most of them, like 76%, do not have a mortgage. So it's really a valid approach to living um, much more, um, less expensively. And in 2015, um, my company was part of a tiny home jamboree. They expected 10,000 people. Brian, you were there as well. 40,000 people showed up. So it was a huge, explosive kind of fun industry to me. It seemed like my early days of the PC industry. 
Um, so what is part of what has generated this? In 1950, average home, pri home, si home size, 980 square feet, with four people living in it. Today, it's over 2,800 square feet, and usually it's just two or 2.1 people living in the house. So what has happened to our society, and what happened to cause this? Um, and what got, one thing that got me interested, I don't know if you can see this, this is a slide that I took from a, a real estate um, booklet in the Denver six county area back in 2015 that talked about the listings of small houses. So the, the bars on the, on the top are small um, and the inventory and then the price. So what was happening was no one was building small homes anymore. So in my, when I graduated from college and started out, there were starter homes. But in this day and age, no more starter homes. So this is not only damaging um, to young people and older people in a financial crisis, but you also think about the impact of student debt. So, and by the way, if you looked at this picture today, it's probably no different. So we have to look at policies that are bigger than um, all of that. So the reality today for tiny homes, um, the building codes and city expectations are different city by city, county by county. That makes it very difficult for builders to, to know exactly what they can build and where they can be permitted. Um, zoning and land use and density are bigger issues even than the codes. So what you just heard is the city of Bol Boulder has adopted a version of the code, the IRC code, that allows a small home, if it is, or a tiny home, if it's on a foundation. But does that solve the zoning and the land use issues and the density perceptions in this town? No. You look at the land and the land costs. So this is one very specific thing for the city of Boulder. How much is land? Kind of expensive, isn't it? So how many people are going to buy an $80,000 uh, tiny home and put it on a piece of property in Boulder? Exactly zero. Because they can't afford the land. You don't put an $80,000 house on a $500,000 piece of property. Um, the cost of building, I was talking to um, you before, the cost of building has, has erupted about 40% in the last probably three or four years. That includes building materials, it includes a place to build it, and it includes labor. So the cost of building these units has become um, more and more of an issue. That's true with the entire housing industry, but I want you to know it's also true unless you use something like a Habitat or something like that, the cost of building them is very real. Financing is an issue because uh, banks don't like to do something they don't really understand. So the question is, how many real people live in small, tiny houses? And frankly, not very many. And that's because we haven't been creative about solving a lot of these issues. Um, so what are some very appropriate uses for tiny homes? And when I say tiny homes, I mean uh, the ones that are not put on um, IRC code, that are not put on a trailer. They're definitely fantastic for homeless. I mean, why wouldn't we? In fact, uh, the council went to Portland, came back, and Aaron Brockett and I were really trying to get us to do something for the homeless, and the council voted it down. But that would be a great um, area. Something like college housing. We have college kids that are spending $1,400 a month on housing up on the hill. Why wouldn't we consider temporary something at CU South allowing uh, students to stay in, in tiny homes? They could cut their, uh, their housing bill and their uh, student debt by huge amounts. Pocket neighborhoods where land is cheap or adding them to mobile home parks, no brainer, and then um, part-time cabins. So now I'd, I'd like to serve a, up a few ideas that we might talk about as a group um, that are a little bit more um, uh, broader than just um, bringing in tiny homes. So when you look at this whole issue, Jan, I s Jan yes. at this point, I would like us to maintain the focus okay. for this portion of it right. on the, the kind of the tiny home stuff. And then as we sit and have a discussion, I think there will be space for kind of more of that pro and con piece. Okay. okay Maybe I can that's okay. mention these real quickly. 
Um, so one thing we'll go ahead and run through them real fast. And then okay, Jay. One thing Jay has mentioned is that they're really approved as accessory dwelling units. That's true. We still have the most arduous ADU um, guidelines in the country. So one thing we could consider is having two structures on a, on a piece of property. That could be an ADU and a main. Um, in 1990s, uh, Boulder had house behind a house. It was a program. So that's one thing we should consider. Number two, give financial benefits for building smaller. So more carrots, like um, waive some of those fees, like what uh, Jay talked about. So some of the things that today would prevent it, um, change this policy slightly. Um, another thing is to remove livability standards. So some of the things that we have is uh, an, an idea that a room size should be not smaller than a certain room size. That's not health and safety. That's a perceived attitude. Um, we have livability standards that affect all of our affordable housing, like you have to have a coat closet, you have to have blinds that come up and down, um, things like that that are perceived things that everyone should have, but, but it adds a lot of cost. Uh, sprinkler systems in a small house. You can walk three steps to the door. Why should you have a sprinkler system? And then finally, educating and enrolling the public about density and environmentalism and how smaller can be very, very important in helping us um, achieve our environmental and affordability objectives. Well, yeah, and I think, thanks, Jan. I think that all of those pieces are a big part of what we're gonna wanna look into and discuss in this. So um, I'm sure there's going to be lots of thoughts about the zoning pieces and the density. So thanks a bunch, Jan, for that. Um, and then our final speaker is Mark Solomon. And Mark is with the Veterans Community Project. He's the founder. Uh, and he's been doing some great work in, he's a veteran himself, and he's been doing some great work in housing veterans. Um, using tiny homes, both in Kansas City and now in Longmont. And so he's gonna give us a little bit of a picture of the community that served, or one community, and how it's been served, and then also talk a little bit about his experience with getting these projects off the ground and getting tiny homes allowed in these developments. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and board members. So a little bit about us. Veterans Community Project started by combat veterans. I uh, am probably the best looking one on that slide just for reference in case anybody's <laughs> wondering. Um, I've, uh, I am in the Navy still, 15 and a half years. Um, served in Baghdad in 2008, to, or 2007, 2008. Came back basically with these gentlemen, realized that there was a need for serving veterans. These are people who were willing to give their life for their country, and when they came home, a lot of times the hoops you have to jump through, the answer is a lot of times no. Um, you know, we don't have money for a bus pass so that you can get to work. Uh, we don't have money to help you with your rent payment so you get kicked out of your apartment, whatever it is. The answer was typically no, and so we decided we wanted to form an organization that said yes. Nationally, just so you understand a little bit about where we started and why, um, the, the government estimates there's about 40,000 homeless veterans sleeping on the streets every given night. In Kansas City, we estimate about 250 or so veterans every night sleeping on the streets. Uh, here in Boulder County, there's probably, in terms of veteran-specific population for homeless, there's probably 70 to 100 people every single night sleeping on the streets. Most of these uh, folks are in conditions that we would not consider habitable, and so again, we wanted to do something about that. So our mission is to build and maintain transitional housing. The houses themselves are permanent. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yet the, the veterans uh, transition through the homes. Say yes to every veteran in need through outreach programs as well as community-based housing and then connect veterans and the community together. This is the land we bought in Kansas City. Uh, the city sold it to us for $500 and uh, didn't have any infrastructure, sewer, water, electric. I know those prices are a little different here. Uh, <laughs> so five acres of land, $500. Retail of that land uh, would probably be approximately, uh, Kansas City at the time, about $40,000-ish for that property. 
The uh, picture on the right is kind of our concept plan. So we, our goal was to put 49 tiny houses on this plot of land and a community center to serve the veterans there. And that is exactly what we did. We use um, trades, volunteers, uh, members of the community to help us build these houses. They are built on foundations. Um, they are uh, permitted structures, so they meet all building codes for new construction. We talked about the IRC um, codes being adopted. I was actually at the meeting and happened to be in Kansas City uh, for the IRC uh, when, when those codes were adopted. Uh, so that was a neat thing. It allowed uh, municipalities to do exactly what's happened here, which is, which is a neat uh, framework to start, right? It's a blueprint, basically. In Kansas City, uh, they, they uh, I believe, even to this day, have not adopted those. So we're using um, basically old cottage codes that uh, were basically started, I think, when the pilgrims came. <laughs> it's not entirely accurate, <laughs> history-wise. And so, um, again, we, we use volunteers, uh, but there is sewer, water, electric infrastructure. Again, they're permanent structures. This is what the village looks like. Uh, these are our single occupancy units. They're 240 square feet. We uh, varied the roof lines, the colors, uh, things like that, so that it looks more like a subdivision instead of a row of tract houses. The houses behind this picture are actually um, family units. We have, in Kansas City, of the 49 tiny houses we have, we actually have four family units, and we do have families living with us. So we've got um, veterans, um, men, women, peacetime vets, wartime vets. We serve any veteran who ever served. So regardless of their discharge status, uh, we don't take any federal funds, so it's all private funds. So we are able to serve any veteran in need. This is a picture of our village about a month ago. Um, we're working on the grass, but we just finished this. This was about a two-year process to, to do all 49 tiny houses. The building in the upper left is our community center. It's a 5,000 square foot facility that services the veterans in the village. We've got a dentist chair there. We've got uh, haircuts available. We have people that come in and volunteer and give the vets haircuts. We also have a dog washing station in a veterinary uh, area. Right now, or as of about two months ago before we finished the last phase of houses, we had 20, six tiny houses um, on the right side there before we finish the ones on the left. And uh, we have 10 dogs and two cats that live with us as well as our veterans. So we treat the whole person, including their family members, and in this case, that may be their pets. Vets um, typically, especially if they live on the streets and they have a pet, they're not going into a shelter because most shelters won't take their pets and they're not leaving their dog outside in the winter. So they'll just sleep on the streets. Also, another reason for um, this particular population is, as a veteran, I will tell you, I don't have PTSD-type issues, yet I'm not going to sleep with a thousand other people. Um, when we were eating, uh, you know, dinner back here, my door, my back was to this door back here, and that kind of makes me a little nervous, right? So um, we design our houses with veterans in mind. Basically, they have uh, their own kind of private space in the back. All the windows are on the one side, so they have total control of their space. With living in our village, it comes with um, case management. We have an eight to one caseload with our case managers that make sure that our veterans are taken care of, so it's very accountable. Um, and the veterans actually have formed a community, so it's almost barrack style living without the barracks. So the veterans take care of each other uh, to make sure that they're not doing silly things that they shouldn't do. To the point of, as I mentioned, we have children living in our village with our veterans. One of our veterans got custody of his kids back every other weekend, so very safe place. This is uh, basically just a picture of the interior of uh, one of our, our units. Uh, the bigger family unit uh, is 320 square feet. Our individual unit is 240 square feet. And again, we can sleep up to seven. So there's a picture of the front door and then the kitchen. And this is from the front door looking back. The kitchen is to the right there. So you'll see the, the bunk beds um, and then the, uh, the pull out. And the bathroom is sort of around to the right back there. And there's a nice barn door that makes it uh, private. And then this is just a quick look at the kitchen. So um, the houses come fully furnished for our veterans, um, all the way down to knives and silverware and all that. What's kind of neat for me is when they transition out of our program, they can stay up to two years in our program. When they transition out, 
we make sure that they get to take everything with them. So if they go into an apartment or whatever it is, more permanent type housing, now they have all of the things they need. They can take the bed and all that. We basically just refit the house with all of those things and then keep on going. Uh, another way we get the community involved is we actually typically will do when we were refitting a house with uh, for a new resident, we will uh, just put an Amazon wish list out. And then people just click, stuff just shows up, and now we can outfit a new house. So it's a neat way to get the community involved, even if they can't come down and volunteer or help us build or do any of that. Sometimes it's just easy to go online and click. And last couple of slides here. Um, so we're actually going to be building uh, a community in Longmont. We should hopefully break ground sometime in the next 60 days, and then we will uh, build houses later this summer. Hope to have 10 done by the end of this year and 16 more next year along with a 3,000 square foot community center. What's really neat about what Longmont is doing is that uh, they are putting the tiny houses for homeless veterans next to a high-end subdivision. So this is a map of the entire subdivision. Don't quote the subdivision on this, this may have changed some. The red is uh, condos, the kind of orange color is townhouses, and then the yellow is single family. Anywhere from the condos being 300-ish thousand dollars all the way to the single family up to $900,000. And the bottom left corner uh, with the purple there, that's actually that row of purple is Habitat for Humanity. There'll be uh, eight lots with uh, duplexes, and then our 26 tiny houses will be right next to that. So basically, uh, we'll have 26 homeless veterans living on purpose next to a high-end subdivision in Longmont. It's the only place in the country that I know this is happening. And this is kind of a close-up view of what that will look like. So basically, you've got our community center in the middle, and then the houses go all the way around. Um, again, the idea is to have these little cul-de-sacs that'll actually be fire pit type areas and things like that to build a sense of community with the veterans um, parking. And then on the left is where the habitat homes will go. The developer is HMS Development. Uh, they are, the developer not only wants to have amazing amenities, so you can see the blue towards the bottom, there's a you know tennis court, things like that, um, world-class pool, all those sorts of things for the high-end subdivision. The developer really feels like going forward, one of the amenities in every subdivision should be compassion. And so he's putting his money where his mouth is, and that land will be donated to us uh, before we build our houses. Um, he's gonna put in all the sewer water and electric infrastructure. It's about a $3 million donation. So briefly, um, and my time is up, so let me just um, briefly just talk through some of the things that um, I know we, we talked about in terms of what are the issues. Um, there's no magic formula. Uh, we've had over 3,000 other cities reach out to us and say, hey, we love what you're doing in Kansas City. Come to our town and do that. Uh, every town is very different. It's really just the will uh, to do it and some creativity, truthfully. Okay, and that's what we found. So uh, a lot of places, it's mixed-use development in uh, Longmont. Actually, the uh, the area is uh, zoned. So it's zoning that's really the issue. Um, the the code compliance. There's usually no variance on code compliance. We meet, you know, in in. Um, Infrastructure, you know, we have uh, trades that come in and do the, the electric and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in Longmont, it's a mixed use employment or multifamily. So in some areas, they're treating us like multifamily, in other places, they're treating us like single family homes. And so they're just being very creative in terms of Longmont and how they're doing it. They're also expediting through the process. So this subdivision would probably take somewhere between three and four years to be approved. With us being attached to that, uh, the city of Longmont is expediting the approval process for this. It'll probably be about 18 months from start to end. So the developer gets to build houses sooner. Uh, the city gets to solve their veteran homeless problem, and we get land, sewer, water, and electric uh, to be able to, to house homeless veterans. So it's a win for everybody. Uh, and, and as Jan mentioned too, there's, it's, it's clearly an option for, for homelessness, right? And how you address that. So again, in a small space, we'll have those 26 tiny houses and a community center to be able to support those vets. Thanks, yeah, questions from here? And I would again, Say, let's try to keep it brief because we'll have Mark with us and the circle and we can do any, but yeah, let's get a couple out. Do you have a, how many acres to houses you have? 
Um, I don't specifically. I can get that for you. Okay. And are these all home ownership or are any rentals? They're, um, they're all transitional, it's rent free, so the veterans just stay for a period of time, get the help they need. We, we don't uh, reinvent any services, so we partner with other organizations that already provide service, civilian if necessary, um, if they don't, aren't eligible for veteran services uh, or other veteran services. And then, so they come into our house, um, our houses, they stay for a period of time until, they, until we feel like they can transition to the next phase, whatever that is. We teach them how to cook and how to clean and how to budget, all of those things, uh, make sure they get to their PTSD counseling, all that. Um, and once they get to a certain point, then they can transition out. We actually had a, a veteran go from uh, homelessness, she was sleeping in her car, uh, hotels, things like that. She came to our village, stayed about 18 months. She just became a Habitat home owner, owner sorry, owner and owner, um, <laughs> uh, in Kansas City. So she went from homelessness to home ownership with a transition through our program for 18 months. Nice. So there's no cap on that back end uh, as far as like short or long term? Yeah, in terms of uh, stay, stay yeah. yeah, the two years is really, uh, one, we, we believe we aren't doing our job if we can get, if it takes longer than that. Okay. The second piece is if they are eligible for VA services, they get to maintain their homeless status during that time. So the VA considers them still homeless as long as it's less than two years in a day. Mm -hmm. So when they're done with our program and now they're better, then they can transition to programs where the VA will pay for an apartment or something like that as a homeless person. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden they're they're well off and they can transition. We started with 5% uh, employment when we first housed our first vets and we're at 95% employment. So we also, we do lots of things, including getting jobs for our vets and making sure that they're stable. Thank you. Yes. Danny. You mentioned something about uh, not seeking federal funding or avoiding federal yes, funding. Um, and I'm just wondering why particularly DOD funding, I thought, would yeah. make, or VA funding would be Great. So quick story, I'm a, a Navy reservist, I've always been in the reserves. Um, if I had not deployed when I did, and let's say I, I hadn't served in the Navy um, up until six years as a reservist, one week in a month, two weeks a year, let's say I did five and a half years and something happened, civilian side or military side, I got injured, uh, I would not be considered a veteran, even though I served five years in the reserves. Six years is the cutoff. We had a vet, uh, so that would be one example why. So then if I went to the program like this that said you must be a veteran and eligible, prove it, sorry, we can't help you go someplace else, right? The idea was to say yes to vets. We had a vet, a uh, Marine, uh, three times uh, DUI, got kicked out of the Marine Corps with a dishonorable discharge. Uh, he's a four-time combat tour vet, three times in Afghanistan, one time in Iraq. So he's self-medicating his PTSD. He's not eligible for veteran services. Because of the dishonorable discharge. Because of the, so, so that's why we've decided that we're just not going to do that. We take support from cities and, and municipalities, things like that. But we don't take any federal funds so that we can help veterans any way they need. Okay, Mason. Sorry, one last question. Um, so we know with fixed foundation homes, it's actually more environmentally friendly to have shared walls. Why would you opt in a fixed foundation situation like this to have them spaced apart? So one of the things we found is that, um, one thing I didn't mention is that this plot of land at $40,000, um, we had it reappraised. So we moved homeless people to this area of land uh, and increased the property value to about 1.5 million right now. So we're sort of changing the narrative around homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of it, is that uh, there's um, a, a sort of a value in single, fa single homes, right? Single family homes, we'll call them. And so having that spacing allows, one, the veteran to have their own space, and two, it also helped us in terms of how we're, we're um, interfacing with the community in terms of we're actually adding value to the property that we, we developed. Does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> also, I, I'm a little confused because to me it's like how would um, two duplexes or a triplex not add value the same way that... So at least, yeah. at least Kansas City wise what I'll say is that a duplex is not as valuable as a single family home. Mm. Uh, okay. Right, so, Got it. and I know things may be slightly different here, so, uh, but that's where, um, so for us, and we also can build these things, retail would be, I think you had kind of mentioned, um, you know, retail might be sixty to $80,000 on these with volunteers and, and donated material. We can, we can build one of these houses in Longmont and house a vet for an entire year for $35,000. So it's a whole lot cheaper to do it that way. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, awesome, Mark. Thank you for that, and good work. Um.
impressive. Um, so I think. So what we'll do now is uh, those chairs that I moved back out, let's go ahead and I think instead of creating a full circle here, let's just do the semicircle kind of as it was again, and we'll put those chairs back. Um, I have six people who've signed up and given me names, I think six or seven, um, to speak. That doesn't mean if you didn't sign up that you can't raise your hand and engage in this discussion. Okay, so don't feel limited by that, but I will call on these six first and we'll get your input and start the discussion there. Um, do we actually take a break? Yeah, I was going to say, what do you guys feel? Do you want to do a quick break? Should we just we have to do them. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so we'll take a quick five minute break too for anybody who needs that and then we'll then we reassess. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Did you use Habitat in Kansas City too? Um, so that's actually separate. So um, we didn't do anything with Habitat there. We just happened to yeah. partner with them separately on that particular veteran. Did you get the volunteer labor in Kansas City too? Yeah. So you're just using the Habitat model more um, in terms of construction. In terms of the construction.
Okay, they're ready. Testing, testing. Okay, everybody, we are going to get started here. So, um, actually, I need to find the uh, slips with everybody's name. What happened to those names? Um, I don't know where you put them. I thought I put them right here. No, did I put them on the chair? <laughs> oh, here, I've got them. Yeah, well. Yeah, if you come on down. Together more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> couple of couple of things that we'll try to see how this works. I would like to use the microphones kind of as the talking stick. So, if you have it, feel free to talk. Um, if you signed up in general, we have a three minute time limit per individual. Uh, I don't think anybody pooled time, so that's just what it'll be, and you'll hear a beep. Uh, Corey will keep us on time. So if you have something, try to keep in mind a three-minute limit on that, and uh, and we'll go through, as I said, these first six here. And then I know some of you uh, took papers but didn't necessarily fill them out thinking you might want to speak or you might not. If you decide to, that's great. Just please leave them with me because uh, it's just helpful for us to know who spoke and what your perspective was and what's going on. It helps us track, okay? Um, you, let me, yeah, you go, actually, you go ahead, two things. Okay. Um, I would like to add on to what you're structurally saying as well is that it, whenever we do the listening sessions, they, it, for some people this isn't a very emotional topic. Some, we might have unhoused individuals here, we might have people that are looking for transitional housing. So to keep in mind that um, you know we're, we're creating a brave space here and we're not attacking each other. Uh, the second thing is is that there are business owners that are here as well and that we're not here to center businesses or what you want to achieve in this community. We're here to listen to what people want to put forth for housing as housing options or expressing of your own opinions um, about tiny houses along that. Does that make sense? Um, one other quick piece, uh, shout out to our council members. We've got Adam Swetlick and Rachel Friend in the house back there. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, and with that, I think uh, Byron Fears is our first uh, member up. Thank you. I'm Byron Fears, owner of Simplicity Tiny Homes and Lions, also on the board of directors of the Tiny Home Industry Association, which is trying to help create regulations in the realm of tiny home building. Um, I'm very excited about Boulder entertaining tiny homes. I'm not excited that they're shooting themselves in the foot for attainable housing by not allowing them being on wheels. Pardon me, not allowing them to be on wheels. I think um, Boulder needs to take a look at this a little more and become more educated about the on wheels portion. I've got a stronger foundation as you're gonna get, especially if you uh, deal with bentonite soil around the metro, metro area, our house isn't gonna shift. Foundations are gonna hold up. So I'd like to uh, really urge Porter to consider the on wheels process. I did testify at the council meeting about a month and a half ago and um, helped convince them that building in a factory or at a building facility like ours in Lyons with a third party inspector is permissible to be put on foundation here, which I felt was a major movement on Boulder's part to go there instead of just uh, foundation built on site. Benefits of being on wheels. One is attainability. By placing them on foundations, what you're creating is a situation where someone's gonna be having to put an extra 50 to $70,000 possibly into a foundation. It's not gonna be an attainable home, it's gonna be a rental home. If you had tiny homes on wheels, you could move that home into the backyard and it could be someone else's home. And so it creates a whole nother living situation which I think is in more alignment with what Boulder says they're about. I lived in Boulder back in the 70s and I was gone for a while so I kind of have a little bit of a finger on the pulse of what Boulder says they're about rather than what they are about. Uh, I'd like to see them be more in alignment with the 
old uh, green way and really trying to help the lower class people, not lower income people, not lower class people. I also like to get you to entertain the idea of attainable rather than affordable housing. It's a whole nother concept. We all know how housing is in Colorado now in the Front Range, it's insane. You can't buy a house unless you're making $200,000, well, maybe $150,000 a year for the most part. And the attainability is very important. There's so much I'd like to share, and I'm gonna try and just go over it real quickly. Something that is really amazing to me, when we first started building houses, we are one of the uh, early builders in the country. Back when we started building, there might have been 10 or 15 serious builders in the whole country. Now there's 500 people that say they're builders of tiny homes. I debate that, but there's those that say they are. <laughs> and if you saw some of the quality, you would understand. Part of why we're trying to uh, develop standards, part of Appendix Q is really bringing that into alignment. So anyway, when we started building, I thought it was gonna be more people in their 20s and 30s interested. But actually it's baby boomers that are the highest demographic of interest in tiny homes. We are now at a point after, uh-oh. I think we'll, we'll say stop there. I think there's something to talk about security. Okay. Okay, let me just finish just one statement real fast, extremely fast. I'm not gonna pull a presidential debate one. Anyway, our, demo, our main demographic of interest are baby boomers. We've come to a point where the majority of our tiny home owners that we've built for are women, single women, and probably almost half of those are retired. So this is a whole nother concept that I don't think Boulder realizes, and most of the country doesn't realize the main people that are getting tiny homes on wheels. All right. Thank you. I can let you pass that along. Okay. Yes. Any yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, thank you and welcome. Um, I just have I just have a couple of little questions. The uh, I don't know very much about this, and I don't have a horse in the race. So these are just questions I have. Um, can the Homes on wheels, um, what do you do about things like gas and electricity and water and sewage? Did, can that hook up to um, a structure? Are they self-contained? Most certainly, and I'm glad you asked that. I was uh, very instrumental in helping Lions develop their ADU laws for tiny homes on wheels. They had the wisdom of waiving any tap fees. You can't afford to have a thirty-five dollars or $60,000 tap fee for a tiny home on wheels. People who live in tiny homes typically live a much more sustainable lifestyle. They are not gonna be using as much electricity, as much water, they're not gonna have as much impact on the sewers. We hook up just like any house, we have a breaker box, we could go solar if you want to, we have a sewer line that goes out and go into a hatch, hook up to a sewer line. Our hookups for electrical could be as simple as a heavy duty uh, RV cord plugged into an outlet at a breaker box. You know, it's, just like a regular house. It's just a different dimension. Thank you, and my second question is, if some people object to tiny homes on wheels because of how they look or something, can there be skirts put around them like there are on manufactured housing in mobile home parks? Or Perhaps those people haven't seen the tiny homes we build. <laughs> okay, I built a home that looks like a stone cottage on a foundation. We skirted it with the same faux stone on the bottom of it. And construction dudes go, whoa, this is in a really heavy house. How are you gonna pull it? They thought it was real stone. And it's like, it looks like a classic old English stone cottage. So you make it, we make them look, we can build them to look like the house that they're behind. We can build them really classy looking. We can build them basic. Uh, yeah. How much do they cost? Our homes range basically between 65 and $130,000. And how big are they? From 24 by eight to uh, 10 by 34 so far. But the 10 foot ones uh, is on wheels? Correct. So You I can build up to uh, 11 foot six wide on well wheels. Just, when you take it down the road, you have to have a special a use wide, permit wide for towing. Permit. Got it. Yeah. Next up, let's see, that's not number two, where'd number two go there? Uh, Josh Davis. Hi there, everybody. My name's Josh. Uh, I'm a Boulder native and an artist in, here in Boulder. Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what it's like to be a very low-income artist and try to uh, afford housing here in Boulder. 
um, I have been searching for a house to buy for about six years, uh, right when the, the boom kind of happened. And it's been a very frustrating and, and, and uh, emotional experience. Um, as somebody who has grown up here and done uh, lots of uh, building and sustaining of community, um, trying to <clears throat> afford a house here is, is just, it's astronomical. Uh, so a very real option is tiny houses. And uh, to have, you know, city officials say that it's not a feasible thing because they don't know what it's about or why somebody wants to live in it or they think it looks trashy or whatever the reason is, is it, it feels like a slap in the face to uh, a group of people who create the culture here in Boulder. A lot of people li love Boulder because of the artistic community here. And uh, when you continue to shut out those people financially, it, uh, it, it just... Uh, excuse me, um, compounds that cycle of gentrification. And uh, typically it's the artistic type people who, that make people want to come to places like this. So um, <clears throat> I have been designing my own tiny house for the past six months or so. It is on wheels. I hope someday that it will be a legal thing so that I don't have to like try to hide it from you guys. <laughs> um, and uh, I'd just like to sort of stack on a couple of points that some of the other people have made um, around the land cost here and, and how a person is supposed to afford to uh, buy a piece of land here when they can't afford to buy a house here. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So it just it seems that much more important to, to look at how you can regulate properly uh, the tiny house on wheels thing. It just it, it makes so much more sense. Uh, otherwise, you're just creating more rental income for the wealthy people here. So that's, that's all I'll say. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate your sharing. And I know I think that's a big driver for many of us here is this, you know, I mean, I'm raising two kids now. They're only five years away from trying to live here. And we're all working on that. Um, also, one note, as you build your house, if you don't want to have to hide it, pay attention to the codes. Because, <laughs> so we can, yes. Um, yeah. The, let's see, I have, any questions here? No, I, For Josh, I or we're good to go? You say to pay attention to the codes and... There is a company that certifies tiny houses if you videotape the entire process from beginning to end. So if you film everything and they can um, certify it from that space. So just keep that in mind. Another note on that, um, and this was from talking to Dan Fitzpatrick. If anybody's out there building their tiny home, he made a suggestion, make all panels that cover electrical, plumbing, et cetera, removable so that if it comes to a place where you need to get inspected, you could, you could be inspected. So just little, little tidbits of how to tiny home um, from a guy who's just starting to learn. I see Art Laubach. Art. Thanks, everybody. My name is Art Laubach. I'm the... Uh, organizer of the Colorado Tiny House Festival and the director of the Colorado Tiny House Association. And I'm also a builder uh, with Einstein Tiny Homes out of Brighton. Um, so I, I wanna come off of what uh, Byron had mentioned. So at the festival, we get usually about 20,000 people out for the weekend. And of that group of people that come out from all over the world, actually, I mean, people from Japan, Australia come out, usually it's from the front range. Um, but we get uh, people from all over the country, and the two largest demographics are people from 25 to 32 and the baby boomers. Um, and this is not a shrinking market either. Every year that we've polled and discussed, hey, did you sell anything at the festival or did you, did you make a sale for the professional builders, that number has risen every year. 
last year we had uh, roughly 70% of the people who showed a structure made a sale from it. So the the fact is is that there's a large number of people who are, are buying these or building them themselves. Um, and I think that there are, there are two sides of this. There's the homeowner in whatever county. Tiny homes benefit people on both, both sides of the coin. A lot of people don't want to talk about rental income for people who are already wealthy. But it is a fact. You know, you, if, you, if you bring a tiny home in on wheels, I don't have to spend $100,000 to build an ADU, but maybe I'm making $400 a month in, in rent for utility and space. So and the flip side of the coin for the other side is the person who can't afford $1,400 a month for rent or they can't afford whatever that cost would be. Because we, I think we'd all agree that an ADU that was built on a foundation is going to have a higher cost of rent than somebody who built their tiny home and they've moved it in on wheels. Um, and then the person who can afford that tiny home has their own home, granted they're renting space. And I, this is something I know a lot about because I own property that I rent space to people who live in tiny homes. So it's not compliant, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's in a place where it's very rural and nobody cares. So, um, <laughs> so I think that... Uh, you know, I, there are a lot of concerns from communities. You know, they say, uh, I don't want it to be trashy, right? They don't, they don't want it to be trashy or they're uh, concerned about their property values. People that are concerned about their property values don't understand how properties are valued. Um, so ADUs on foundation do nothing but add the value to a property. And anything that can be moved in on wheels can be moved out. So. Awesome, thanks. All right, appreciate that, and sorry about the name, no butcher. Oh, no. Um, Fine. Good for me. Uh, I do think that this is one of the things that we'll be talking about is how ADUs on wheels allow the value to move with the owner, and I think that's a huge, a huge benefit that we really have to think about when we consider whether we limit to foundations or not. So, thanks for bringing that point up, um, Jeremy. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, my name's Jeremy. Uh, tiny house on wheels, uh, like other mobile dwellings, I like to classify them as such as RVs, sprinter vans, and convertible school buses, are viable, low cost solutions to offset affordable housing shortages. Also, allowing the property owner to host mobile dwellers on their private land will diversify the community as well as boost the local economy through indiv higher individual spending because they're saving more on rent. Um, it would also reduce the amount of daily traffic coming into a town, offset the carbon footprint, and should limit the government's need to fund or build new infrastructure to support lower income earners. Uh, restrict restrictive zoning is counterproductive to reducing people's reliance on the government. Instead, governments should be embracing people willing and able to host these hardworking people who choose or have to live in tiny or mobile homes. A couple things I heard tonight, uh, one of the things was, why does it have to be fixed? I have never understood why people feel it has to be fixed. We ha are gonna use the same exact utilities that a fixed home would use. They're just not connected, and I feel like that is comes down always to a money thing. Why else would it be? I don't know. Uh, and then the other one was for tiny houses and RVs. If t if tiny houses are regulated the same as RVs, then why don't we treat them the same, or why are they being treated differently? Other than from an aesthetic standpoint, I can understand. And then there was a question that was raised, do real people live in them? There's an estimated one million people in the United States currently that live full-time in RVs. The city of Los Angeles has currently 28,000 people living on the streets in their cars or RVs. So yes, real people are living them, living them and uh, really, real people that live in these tiny places, they just need stability like anyone else that's trying to be a productive member of society. If you have to worry about where your house is gonna be every night or if it's safe on the road or if some neighbor's gonna call the cops on you, that's a stress that you just don't need to try to get ahead um, financially. So I guess that's pretty much what I have. And then just one real quick one. A lot of people that work here in the service industry are commuting from Boulder, or sorry, from Longmont, Lafayette, Erie, 
just real rough calculation. That's approximately 600 miles a month that they are going uh, to travel just to work. And you know, we see the fog on the Front Range all the time now. That's if we could reduce even 100 people from having to commute into the town. That's six, what, 600,000 miles a month of travel. I mean, that's tons of gasoline offset and. Uh, again, if you get more people that are lower income earners in the community saving on rent, they will spend their money on goods and services that are going to benefit the city of Boulder businesses as well as the city of Boulder from sales tax and whatever else. Thank you. Thanks. Mason, question? No, not a question. Actually, um, uh, last year I contacted the RV um, National Association, 3.5 million, and that's of the RV dwellers full time. And they estimate that there's probably a, at least another mill, if not two, of unrecorded ones, uh, which I think is a pretty sizable number. It's really about networking too. It's a new type of homeowner now. It's people that are living in mobile dwellings uh, with the homeowner or landowner property, or however you want to describe it. Like Har was saying, you can get, it also gives that property owner added sense of security potentially if they're out in a rural area, having someone out So I'm a complete advocate, and that's a whole nother listening session. Um, but just know that you're you're speaking to the choir. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this is our entire effort with the affordability, or as you said, attainability. If I can just interject for just a quick second. If you speak, you, because we are televised, it's very important that you have to have the microphone. Otherwise, nothing that you're saying will be captured on film. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Okay, we have um, Joe. Calentine? Calentine. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Calentine. I, I come on behalf of representing my own company of Life Size Tiny Communities, uh, officially launched in September of 2018 for the sole purpose and mission to develop community specific to tiny houses. The the concept of the village life that was put up on the screen during the the mission or the the start of everything tonight was is really what I'm focusing on to be able to actually create a a community space that is of like-minded individuals that want to and choose to live this type of lifestyle because it's not necessarily about a demographic that is going towards the tiny house life because this is something that people are actively deciding on that works best for them and their lives and how they can personally secure their own financial future. When 2008 happened and the financial uh, crisis happened, people were like, how can I recession-proof my life? How can I prevent this from happening to me and my family in the future? And with Jay Schaefer and all the things that he did in 2008 as far as like moving this movement, and it's not a new concept. It, tiny living has been around for eons. If you think teepees, if you think wigwams, and mobile living structures have, they're not new. They've been around for a really long time. And being able to travel from one place to another, think covered wagons, you know, the Oregon Trail when people were coming across from the New England states. And the, the biggest point that I want to make with village type of living and these types of structures is the fact that the missing middle went missing somehow or another back in 1940. 
and the community-centric uh, bungalows that we're trying to group together to be able to create that community aspect and pr provide an attainable option for people to get into home, home ownership. Whether it's just a springboard for them not so much transitional housing, but say, okay, I know my family is going to grow. How can I take a hold of my personal finances and start with something smaller? There was mentioned somewhere about starter homes are completely gone these days. And if this is an option for people to have a starter home, then why can we not provide all available paths for them to be able to, well, do it and get themselves started and be able to make that that jump into whatever that they need for bigger phone, big, bigger homes as their family grows and their needs change. So that missing middle aspect is is very important. And if we're able to create a fa single family style home as a tiny house on wheels, uh, preferably because then that provides that flexibility and I'm out of time. Uh, <laughs> So we, if we're able to provide that single family style uh, personal space and privacy and still be able to combine that communal aspect where people are contributing to a bigger, something that's bigger than themselves, similar to what you were doing in your, with your veteran uh, projects, the rest of us want to be able to do that too. And I think we should have the options. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I will go to our last speaker, Alan Peak. Okay. All right, I'll begin. Um, I just want to address a couple of things. I got the notes on my hands here. Um, my tiny house on wheels is eight and a half feet by 13 and a half feet by 26 feet, and I own it. I'm very excited about that. I built it three years ago with my father after I had a very, very difficult time coming back from th uh, two deployments and three campaigns in Iraq. And now I'm a homeowner, homeowner and um, I've really rebuilt my life. I, I really need to tell everyone that, that my tiny house on wheels has rechanged everything about my life. I'm able to use my GI Bill and use it well and become an active part of the community. And um, I'm gonna keep this short, but I'm an activist now and it's not for the tiny house movement. It's for our waterways. And the tiny house on wheels and the tiny house on movement, uh, movement has uh, really enabled me to come back from a car repossession, um, getting kicked out of my apartment because I couldn't live in it. And, and now I'm actually becoming a real active community member. So in the future, I'm gonna look for places to live after I get out of UCCS with probably a dual degree in history and geology. And um, right now it's looking like Lyons will be a really good place. But until then, I am a real tiny home owner and a liver. I live in one full time and I am hiding. Um, and that I think speaks to my military experience, standing up for what's right. And tiny houses are absolutely right for everyone and the freedom of our country. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Alan. And uh, yeah, Lions is great. Um, hopefully we can make space here in Boulder too. Um, Zan, Alexander. Zan, all right, Zan. Hi, I am just so excited to be here. Um, I kind of geeked out on Tiny House Nation recently, <laughs> and so I'm a little obsessed. Um, but I'm just uh, coming from an experiential space. I used to live in Dana Point, California. I had a five-bedroom house, and I, my husband was in the mortgage industry in 2008, and we almost lost everything. Um, left in 2012, traveled for seven years, lived in rooms, lived in community, lived in different spaces, and had to get rid of everything. So every time I moved, it was me, my dog, my car, and that was it. So I'm 49 years old. I had to convert my life, and it is a way of life. 90% of everything that people buy will end up in the trash within six months. Our culture must shift. We do not have 
like a lot of time to worry about what it looks like. We have humans that are dying, we have people that need homes, and this is a solution, and I think that we need to fight hard to make it happen in a much larger scale. Land needs to be provided like you guys are doing, not just for veterans, but for everybody, for artists, for people who are really trying to survive and live, and the baby boomers, like, I don't have like retirement or any of that. I'm just trying to like get ahead and I'm an entrepreneur who's very smart. So it's it's really like a global situation and the resources should be put into this for humanity and not necessarily what are people doing with big houses? They're moving, they're having garage sales, they're getting rid of a bunch of shit, right? So it's like, we need to like downsize as a society. And so I'm just a big advocate for it. So thank you for letting me share. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I only use two minutes. Can you use 30 seconds longer? <laughs> so, really, real sorry here. Oh. All right. There you go. Real quick, I, I added the picture of my tiny house to the agenda or up here. So, that's my tiny house on wheels. And if you look behind it, real quick, it's just a little bit to the right of my house. You can see a traditional style house. There's a hundred houses that are conventional houses in my neighborhood and not one person has complained about my presence. And I haven't brought, home, brought down anyone's home value and houses have bought and sold around my, my house and they've all been really good neighbors to me and they've all welcomed me. No one's complained. So that's the last thing. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just add a couple thoughts as a Boulder homeowner. I'm sorry, my name is Kirsten Erkfritz, and I live um, in North Boulder. And by some grace of God, I managed to get a house here that I really can't afford, but it still has my name on it for the moment. And uh, I've got all my rooms rented out. And um, my taxes have gone up 25% in the last four years. Um, they went from 4,100 to 6,100 or 4,400 to 6,100. And I have like 0.4 acres. I have a whole half, a whole house version of a yard. And I'm right on 19th Street and I can't even park my own RV in my yard because I'm in the flood zone. And it's just ridiculous. Um, there is no reason why I can't um, get someone to move in there and put in a tiny home and we can build a pad and we can connect it to the water and the sewer and put electric in and make it totally legit like if they were in a trailer park and you know, help me pay for this enormous house that, you know, because I don't, I mean, I'm like, my kids are gone, you know, like, I don't need to have a lot, so I don't mind sharing it, because I've always had people around, so I don't mind having community space, and I don't mind having somebody in my yard, and I want somebody to be able to live and be able to have a space that they can call theirs, you know, because I know what that feels like. I lived in a school bus for eight years when I was in my 20s, and it was easier, <laughs> but, um, but you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous. And guess what? We keep reproducing. And that means there's gonna be more people and more people and more people. And it's grotesque that there's 4,200 square foot houses that live, that have four people in them. It's just grotesque. And it's a sign of our culture, which is really grotesque right now with the money. So I am advocating for tiny homes because one, it can help people like me, you know, middle-aged ladies that are just trying to get by because no, we don't have retirements, you know? And we still have grown children that need our financial support even because they can't afford shit. So, um, <laughs> so you know, and like I could put my kid out in the tiny home so I don't have to live with them and pick up after them any freaking more, you know? So there's options and we need to have options. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually we can hand it down that way. So I'm Ralph Fritt, Lafayette. Uh, we have the same problem you have. Um, I'm here because I work, with, correspond with Megan at Boulder County Housing and connecting with NOG. Um, I got really angry. I was trying to get a house for 
a past mayor of Lafayette's children and grandchildren that couldn't live in the area. A flipper beat me to a condo, and so I got so mad I bought a house and I rent it to them well under market value. And I'm here to tell you that I think there's 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 three or four points that, that would really help, at least that I've gotten from this. One is there's no silver bullet to the housing piece. We are short so many houses, we need everything we can get. Density needs to increase. Um, I think the rural parts where you've got some land, Mark, great program. The wrap services, absolutely essential. Tiny homes, great where you put them for transitional service because it's about well-being. It isn't just about home. You brought that point out. It's about your well-being and about being able to move into a next piece. And I think coupling tiny homes the right in the right uh, atmosphere where you've got some space for them, you've got some flexibility, put some density in so that you can get some services for the people that have served us, both past and present. And, and, and where I come to that I think you brought up was, you know, we, we got about eight or nine things here to work, and I'm working on City of Lafayette to be able to say density is not a four-letter word. We can use it. We can use it profitably. And I'm, I'm going to be meeting with Ma uh, McKinsey because to bring another economic model about when you're in a high growth um, mode like we are, you can actually build and, and, and rent under market value because things appreciate so well, you don't have to make your money off the renter. So, so great program, loved everybody that spoke today. Um, are tiny homes legal in mobile home parks? See, Okay, but see, that, that's so ridiculous. There should be able to be, mobile, you know, tiny homes on wheels. It's the same thing. Right. So um, I thought that, that that was true, and I just wanted to bring that up because, I mean, like, there's the Thistle program that has the mobile home park over here on 26th. Fabulous program. People are able to die there, and it's okay. You know, they can survive. Yeah. You can live on Social Security in that park. You know, and then there's the Orchard Park, and they've even got, like, a whole, like, backyard area that could have a tiny home, you know, community circle put in. No problem. It's not a problem. Thank you. Um, um, <laughs> Kurt, can I... I'm going to uh, ask you to just pause for a second. I just wanted to say one thing. It, it appears that the majority of voices that we have here tonight are really pumped up and really pro tiny home. And I just want to make a little bit of space because this is a public listening session. And I just want to say that if there are concerns about tiny homes, these are also the things that we want to hear. And we, I may get no, I may, may get no takers on that, but it, but that's also why we're here. And and it's not only to hear the naysayers, but it's also to understand those concerns and then see how we can adapt the thoughts that we have to make a reality come true. So I just want to open that space up, make sure that everybody's comfortable and feels good about saying, well, what about this? Or this doesn't seem like it's going to work. Well, I think, Jan, didn't you say that you? One question I have about tiny homes on wheels is uh, that what I've seen is people have to buy big transport um, pickups to move them around. So I would be wondering how people solve that issue. Um, and I mean, let's face it, most people put them on wheels to avoid the prying eyes of city officials yeah, because so they're often I hidden. Actually, so Can, well, is, me, what's the purpose of having them on wheels? I understand the cost of foundation, but there's also a cost of building them on that. Um, that right. Well, yeah, so that, I think that's great. And that's kind of, that's what I'm looking for. So first I want to go, because you obviously put a tiny home in a not easy place. And so you move that thing around. So maybe you could talk about moving it around and, and do you have to own your own F-350? That's a good question. And actually, I was on HGTV. I was on Tiny House Big Living and the producer said that this was the most insane move they had ever seen. So to answer your question, and it's just really justification, really. If um, I decide to move somewhere, I'm gonna have to pay either first or last month's rent or I'm gonna have to pay closing costs on a house. 
So if I ever choose to move somewhere, then what I'll do is professionally insured have a professional mover move my house, even though I could probably um, rent a U-Haul. And because it's, it's eight and a half feet wide, by uh, 13 and a half feet tall, all of our driver's license would be able to allow to drive it. I, I don't want to, it's me and my dad built it. So I'm willing to pay about, you know, maybe from where I live in Colorado to here, it would probably cost me about $1,000 to move here. And I am well, so willing to pay that if, if I found a really good legal spot. Yep. So yeah, I don't own a truck. <laughs> Yes, I do. Uh, the question about transportation. One of the first, I talk to a lot of people about tiny homes because they come to see me constantly. One of the first questions they ask after they say, where can I put it, is what do I have to have to pull it? And I go, nothing. There are many professional companies that tow tiny homes and there's no reason to have a sixty to $80,000 truck just pull a tiny home every once in a while. Why on wheels? Job security is not what it was when you and I had the pleasure of growing up. A lot of people have to move because of jobs. It's really nice to have your home that you can take with you instead of going and finding a box that you're gonna rent and try and make it your home or that you're gonna buy. You know, people in the computer industry, working in Seattle for three years, Boulder for three years, you know, Austin for three years, they can take their home with them and they don't have to live in a box and try and make it a home. We don't build tiny houses, we build tiny homes. There's a big difference. Awesome. I also have another concern, since we're talking about concerns. First, okay. first I'm gonna go okay. to Kurt, because he's got, actually got the talking stick. Josh, can you give us? It was just a, a final answer okay, to final question that wasn't addressed. One of the big reasons that I would prefer to have my house on wheels is because I can't afford $500,000 worth of land here. And I can $500,000 worth of land here in Boulder. I'm happy to pay rent to somebody who's willing to let me put my tiny house on their, on their land. And you know, when it's time for me to move along because either I'm ready or they're ready or whatever the case is, I'm able to do that and, and move to the next place. I just, I like some, I think you even mentioned, like no one's putting an $80,000 tiny house on a foundation on a half acres worth of $500,000 worth of land. Yeah, and I'd like to add that I think you brought up a really good point about job stability, but I, also in your demographic of the retiring boomer as well. You know, there's a, how many of us know individuals who are wealthy that have two homes that might be just them and their spouse, and they're flying back and forth from two homes? Um, I know a lot of people that spend six months in one part of this country and then six months in another part of this country, and their house sits empty and their utilities turned off during that other time. I per personally would love to see a tiny house who's renting a backyard somewhere and then traveling down to their warm weather with their, uh, instead of occupying a, you know, a 2,000, 3,000 square foot house um, only half the year. Okay, we're going to go to Kurt. Okay, uh, Kurt Nordbeck, I just wanted to give our, uh, briefly our experience with tiny homes. My wife and I are the lucky ones, the privileged ones. We own a detached single family house in Boulder, but a young woman who happens to be a uh, special ed teacher approached us and said, I'm looking for a place to put a tiny home. Do you know of any place? And we said, well, you know, we have a backyard. And so she bought one from a place uh, in Parker or something. And uh, she spent about a month. She had it moved up with the big F-350 that she hired. And uh, she put it on our yard and she spent about, spent about a month getting it all ready and setting every, up sort of a little yard space and a little walkway and stuff like that. And it was lovely. And um, she moved in and literally the very next day, there was a bright orange sticker on our door from code enforcement. Um, and so to the city's credit, they did give her about a month to, to, to find a different situation. She found a different situation elsewhere in this city. And to my knowledge, she is still there with her tiny home. So the point is that by making them illegal, we're not 
actually getting rid of them. We're forcing people into hiding, like this gentleman here, and we're uh, imposing additional costs on them because she had to hire the F-350 to come out again and move it, and it's an additional stressor. So it, we felt terrible for her. Um, we, we had warned her that it was illegal and she wanted to, she, she felt comfortable going ahead with it, but she didn't realize how, how dire the situation was. Um, so that's our experience. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. So, so Can here's you give us your name again, please? I, it's Ralph Frid, F-R-I-D. My concern is use tiny homes for the right reason in the right place to serve the right purpose. We have many, many people that need housing and, and we're not gonna find one solution that's gonna, gonna fit everything. And one of the things that I come up against all the time is people that get a really, the, the hair raises up on the back of their neck when you start to talk about density, you start to talk about affordability, and we need to use tiny homes in a way that promotes the well-being like Mark is doing here so that everybody gets to see the, the, the positive aspect of this and we don't get the fear, you know, uncertainty and doubt going, and then complement that with other forms of housing that, that meet other, uh, other needs, you know, equitably as well. So I see tiny homes as being one of many solutions, and I think the key is use it in the right place for the right reasons. So that's what I would just say. Yeah, I think I, I like your point. I, I look at the housing thing as, a, as a, a pie. There are many slices to the pie to, to manage affordability. And I think you know, the one thing I, I think we all need to keep in mind is we actually can't afford to toss any of the pieces of the pie out. Um, but as you said, we need to be judicious and thoughtful about how we're going to introduce a concept and an idea and with the hope that we can spread it. I think there's hopefully some concept at the council that we could do a pilot project at some point in time on this. So. Good evening, ML Robles. Um, so it seems to me that there are two parts, right? So there's the people who are investing in owning a home, right? So the, the tiny homeowner, and there are the people who have, who have land. And it seems like in the city, right, there's two things that need to happen. One is A, make tiny houses on wheels legal, but B, maybe start providing a way to create land leases so that it can be kind of a no-brainer, right? There is, right now, the city council is trying to stop ADUs from being sold separately from the main house, so the land lease um, concept, which happens in commercial, it happens in affordable housing, right, condos, that's all land lease. So if people can't afford land, that is a big deterrent. Um, let's look into the idea of a land lease as an opportunity to um, enable people to have the security of bringing their home into properties in Boulder. And I think it starts to bring home ownership, not just to the tiny house, but potentially to the ADUs, to a broader range of people that can afford it now. I do have one concern. Um, and it's more not about affordability, one thing we keep talking about is affordability, 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 affordability. However, this is also for wealthy people. Tiny houses can also be for very, very wealthy people that have a different style of living. And what it really amounts to is freedom. So yes, there is the affordability aspect and giving more freedom to people that might not already be able to afford it. But there's also the aspect that there might be attorneys out there that lead a di very different lifestyle. Doctors that live, lead a different lifestyle. And they don't want a house. They want something very small that they can go home to. And um, I yeah. really think that that's an important part. We talk a lot about affordability, but freedom is really what we should talk about. So my two favorite people I always talk about that are tiny house dwellers. Matthew McConaughey uh, lived in his Airstream and then tiny house for like 10 years before he got married to his wife now and popped up three babies. And the CEO of Zappos um, lives in Las Vegas in a tiny house. And um, exactly. Uh, so there's a lot of brilliant uses. And um, as my green friends know in this community is that 
I, as a personal just comment to this is that her, one, you mentioned people are dying and hurting, but we also have environmental concerns. We cannot continue to build houses and not <coughs> cohabitate together and create community together anymore. So for me, tiny houses is also a very big path towards us um, getting greener and using less um, uh, resources. We just don't have the resources to throw around about it anymore. So there's a sense of urgency. Well said. <laughs> I think we all think tiny homes are great. Is that about the general consensus? I think we all think they're wonderful. The, 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 I thought you were done. No. Adam's around the circle, so we got to Not you. done. <laughs> Adam, anytime. Uh, a couple questions. The, the, the rules for no, uh, for fixed foundation tiny homes that just passed like last year, right? Yesterday. 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 Okay. Do we have any idea how many fixed foundation oppor tiny home opportunities there are in Boulder? Has anybody done that analysis to say, you know, we don't want them on wheels as of yesterday, but we do want them on fixed foundations and we can potentially have X of those. Is that, anybody done that? Well, I mean, it would be similar to what our ADU and the 30% the satur saturation. So those numbers, or I'm sorry, 20% saturation. So it's the same numbers um, as ADUs. So one half of 1%. Yeah, that, sorry? If, if we fully built out all ADUs, which includes garages and everything else and lower basements, that's one half of 1%. So, yeah, sorry, you don't have the microphone. I do. Um, <laughs> So I just, I just wanted to clarify real quickly. So the saturation only applies to the RL zones. So the rest of the city, the rest of the zones where they're allowed, it does not apply. We can go back and look at the ADU analysis that we did and can give you a figure of how many could potentially be built. Um, it's basically how many single family homes do we have in the city? Because each of those would be potentially, if it was, if it was loosened even more, that's the number. So on, on, on every lot, on every single family home lot in the RE zones, we could potentially put a fixed foundation tiny home. RERL, -E all the R's. All the R's. <laughs> all the R's. Um, to play devil's advocate a little bit, I, well, not devil's advocate, but I, I, I'm hearing a lot of we need to get tiny homes on wheels. It sounds like that's a lot of, a lot of heads nodding. From, from a real estate planning perspective, from a real estate investment perspective, I think it doesn't make me nervous, but I think it makes people nervous, right? When people come to Boulder and we're throwing around half a million dollar lots, find me one. They're not, they're, 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 there's no half a million dollar lots anymore. You know, they're, 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 they're more than that. And that's, you know, so, so people spend a lot of money on these properties from all over the place. Some live here, some don't. And, and I think the on wheels, tiny home concept makes people nervous. That's what I think. So how do we alleviate that fear, right? How do we, how do we call that? And I don't have that answer. And I know, you know people are gonna say, oh, well, we can make them look great, and we're gonna put you know, stone skirts around them, and they're not gonna look like they're on wheels. And I just think, uh, I think like with anything, you gotta start with one. You know, you gotta have one successful one. And, and maybe if there's a way to, to, well, it's not gonna happen with wheels and boulder. But th that's the fear. I think that's what people are worried about. Go ahead. No. You, you um, here for a minute. Uh, I just want to be cognizant that I think we've gotten into a good piece of discussion here. Art also had something that he was wanting to add in. Yes. So go ahead and hit that. I'm Keep your point, second. please. And then Adam. Oh. Um, so just one thing I wanted to address really quick was uh, building code compliance. Um, so, uh, as a builder myself, we, the homes that we build, they're, they're out of, they're not compliant with IRC really in two ways, the two by four wall versus a two by six wall and the foundation being a, tra a trailer basically. Um, now you guys build a 240 square foot tiny home on a foundation that is code compliant. Um, and so building codes come from two things, safety and basically the requirement for uh, environmental impacts, R values and 
things like that. You see a lot of the new building codes require some, in some cases in certain jurisdictions around the country, require external insulation, you know what I mean? Some, some things like that. So um, in most cases, all these homes that are being built, they meet all Colorado code for R value in the foundation, in the, in the roof, in the wall. And so you've got basically two variances for code compliance. Now some building departments will say, well, the toilet's too close to the shower, because that's obviously a part of the IRC code as well. But if you can build a 240 square foot foundation home, the 280 square foot home I'm building right now is completely code compliant minus those two factors. So I think that one of the major concerns from um, the government side is code compliance. The fact is, is they're not, they're really not out of compliance. Um, and so there are, there, are, there are answers to every concern, I think. If you were to say, hey, it's, it's gotta meet IRC code, I'm pretty sure that some builders would be willing to put a two by six wall on a trailer, although you might lose 17 square feet. Um, but uh, that, those are the big concerns. The other major concern that you were just referring to about uh, homeowners, people that spend a lot of money on these homes, in general, they're concerned about two things. One of them is outrageous. They don't want to, uh, they don't want drugs moving into the, their, their it's true. We've, I've been to meetings, it's, this is a, it's a legitimate concern. They don't want uh, people running a, a meth lab. This is, this is, I'm hearing someone tell me this in another meeting. Um, but when we watch the news, the DEA is always raiding a nice house in Boulder. They're not raiding <laughs> tiny homes. And so, and then the last point of that is that the, is that, like I said before, the people who are concerned about their property values don't understand how property values are assessed. You know, they're, it's done geographically by a, a, a something that's similar in, in design or size. So um, putting, putting a bunch of tiny homes next to a, a nice subdivision doesn't affect the impact, doesn't impact the value of that home. So it's, and, and in many cases, like where I live, I live in Brighton. If I were to throw a uh, pole barn in the backyard, my property value skyrocket. So um, there, there are a, a lot of those concerns boil pure and simply down to education. It's, it's, it's purely information that people do or don't have or choose not to believe or choose to believe a different thing. It's an intangible, right? It, it's, it's, you know, f fears in any project that we do is they're going to arise. I think it comes down to a will of the people, and I'm wondering if that's something that you were getting ready to say, even though Adam and David are next, and I think it does come down to just a will of deciding, like your gentleman made it a priority of putting it in the subdivision. So. Adam, Adam Swetlick, member of Boulder City Council. Um, I had a quick question since we have a bunch of people who both build and own. Um, is it a depreciating asset? Because um, that's that's just a question that I honestly don't know. And I'm really, really interested because to me it's, it's a home for sure, um, but it gets lumped in sort of with the RV type of um, vehicles in a lot of sentences. So I just want to hear from a couple people about depreciation. Is it a depreciating asset? The property that you own, your house does not appreciate. It's the land, unless you have put a really exceptional, outrageously cool house on your property. It's the value of the dirt that appreciates. There is one inspection agency, which I will not name that says they inspect tiny homes, which is just BS. Um, they recently had a blog out that said, Tiny homes is an investment. It will appreciate in value. They do not appreciate in value. No. Well, I, I think, again, there, there seems to be a huge difference of opinion between tiny homes on wheels and tiny homes on fixed foundation. I think why you see that's, 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 on, I think you answered it on wheels, and I'm a real estate guy, I tend to agree with you. If it's on fixed foundation, I think it absolutely appreciates, and I think it actually adds value to the property that it's on, even if it's an 80. 
it's just, for whatever reason, there's a huge difference of opinion of, of, of there's a psychologically, there's a big difference between wheels and not wheels. And, and we're, we're, we're seeing that flesh out here, right? The fixed foundation seems to be wildly accepted, appreciated, adds value, people love it. It's going in in Longmont, it's going next to million dollar homes, nobody cares, it happened in Kansas City, great. Do we have anything like that on the wheels side? Yeah? I know I can speak for my house and one of the largest mansions in Colorado, it's actually called a compound, is in my neighborhood. Uh, and um, one other thing about it, uh, you know, you talk about people worry about their home value. I've told everyone in my neighborhood what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and how many days I have versus how many days I spend. And they all tell me, you go on with your bad self. You do you. And the houses behind me, they have not depreciated in value at all. So, And they're very close. They're within eyesight. I could throw a tennis ball at them and hit them. So the, to touch on Byron's point is the fact that it is considered chattel in terms of mobile tiny houses. There are, the, the biggest fo focus that I'm, I would like to be able to implement in as far as the private sector is concerned to be able to help combat that very issue is there are creative methods that are out there within the commercial and business world to be able to take that chattel aspect, provide the value for the homeowner as the homeowner, because really, if you think about it, the tiny house is valuable to that owner because, well, it's their house. But if it's the equity aspect that we're looking at to be able to, okay, if I sell this tiny house, am I going to get out of it what I, what I put into it? So in the private sector, there are certainly uh, some business aspects and some things that you can be able to integrate into, say, community-style living to be able to add some equity to that homeowner so that way, okay, I don't want to live in here anymore, but I'm going to take my house with me. I can sell my equity, no longer live in this community, and then take my profit or loss, depending on how the market is, and that still gives you that same quasi-equity aspect of a traditional home. And I own my own property as well that ha is on my house. So I can sell my property if I wanted to as well. We didn't understand that. Can you explain that again? The equity is in the land or in the house? So without going delving into like a lot of the details, the, the equity in and of itself is within the land because by, to Byron's point, the land itself is what holds that value. But there are practices within the business and commercial sectors that you can actually divvy up portions of that to the individuals who are living within that community that is then equitable and marketable and they can sell at a profit or a loss. So they were paying a lease on it. You're saying you repaid part of that lease. Uh, that, that is one avenue that can be explored, yes. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Dave Ensign. So I'm the ex officio uh, liaison to the Housing Advisory Board from the Planning Board. And uh, just thought I'd throw in a few observations based on things I've heard. Um, planning Board routinely sees things in the code that are frustrating to us, of course. And uh, the tiny homes thing is an example of something where we see a lot of value and we always look to hear from the community and that I, I really thank HAB for uh, doing this because we look for opportunities to advise council and to give them our opinion. And I know at least on a few occasions in our annual letter we've recommended looking into a tiny homes pilot, for example. Um, I wanted to just talk about the uh, building code updates that went in. Um, I think that we need to keep one thing in mind. Before those updates went in, uh, I don't think there was any way you could do the on wheels thing uh, before. So what happened was th this fixed foundation thing came in because uh, the, uh, the staff decided to adopt this Appendix Q in the international codes that uh, loosens some standards for the lofts and the stairways and the, uh, uh, the overhead uh, windows and things like that. So it actually kind of opened up the, di the discussion, which was kind of a cool thing. Uh, my sense is that if planning board and council had 
told staff, hey, uh, we, we want to address homes on wheels, they would have had to go off and work for some time, you know, six months. And the overall goal that they were trying to do was just bring the code updates to the latest version of the international standards. So I don't think we lost anything, so I just wanted to make sure people didn't think that we have been losing ground on this. However, um, there was not, you know, I guess it was not seen as an opportunity to necessarily address that. Uh, I do think that to address those kind of things, we're going to, as boards and commissions and as the public, really try to help the council prioritize what to put on the work plan. Uh, so we have the wheels one, which we've heard a lot of voices in the room talk about great things that it does for the individual, and this is really important. We also have an overall inclusionary housing and affordable housing landscape that we have to deal with. So does that fall well within that, and is it something that we'd like to add? And it may be reasonably low-hanging fruit. Like you said, it may not be that big of a change to our uh, building code to do something like that, uh, but it's something that would have to be researched and scheduled. Uh, the other thing is the zoning laws that uh, really make it hard for us to do things like they're doing in Longmont. Uh, dwelling units are very specifically defined, and dwelling units, only a certain number of them can appear on a lot. Attached units are different. In high density residential, you can have big buildings with apartments and condos and stuff. So, but individual detached dwelling units are very hard given our current zoning laws. So that's gonna take ordinances, and we're gonna have to go write that law, right? Uh, so. And uh, there are opportunities. There's uh, area to land uh, that we could annex, and we could write a specific zone to apply to that new piece of land and do a, a, a pilot like they're doing in Longmont. Uh, or potentially, if it's a big enough parcel, we could combine it with uh, other types of housing and fit some, uh, some, uh, uh, some tiny homes in. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Uh, what I think that we really have to do is help HAB and planning board and council kind of prioritize which are the ones that are kind of trickling to the top that we want to attack soon and start to get those on, you know, prioritized. So I think that's just kind of the way it works. So I just wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit. Thank you, David. Um, one thing I don't want to add to that with the low-hanging fruit that you brought up uh, is the financial low-hanging fruit of uh, doing trailers as well is because there are so many people that want to live in our community, and if they've already built their home, we're not asking the city to provide any dollars, and landowners are usually building out the pads. So it, you know, it seems like that's something that we could also be looking at, as well as with the ordinances. I'm curious, could planning board take what Lyons did and and uh, utilize it in some capacity for ours? So Lyons is interesting because they have one tiny homes community that I could find that is more of a, a kind of a rental? Resort. A resort. Right. Uh, and I think resorts are, are, can be built under different kinds of zoning, right? Uh, little cabins that people live in temporarily. So th um, there's that. Well, they're ADUs as... And they also zones. have ADUs, right. And uh, so they also have an ordinance that they did to allow uh, tiny homes as ADUs. And theirs allows on wheels. On wheels. So that, that would be our model. Right. Yeah, exactly. So they, they, so they took that step that we haven't yet... Done. And, and a note on that, there's a couple things I want to, we're going to be wrapping up soon, so there's two things I want to make. I just want to make the note that Lions, um, it's a very limited program, I think, for 12 tiny homes, right. 10 it's tiny homes, it's excuse it's me. Right. That's right, I think it's so actually 10 in the whole city. In, well, yeah. in, in the whole town. It, yeah, and it's a small town, though, however. But um, the other thing that I want to say is we're going to wrap up the listening session portion of this in a few minutes. I want to check in with anyone who hasn't spoken yet and see if there's anybody out there who feels like they haven't spoken and they would like to add something in at this point. And if not, you with the mic can speak and then I think we'll take two more. Um, so I was curious, what is the problem with tiny homes being in mobile home parks? And like, I think that would be a great first step because there's a lot of really junky mobile homes mm -hmm. that could really get used to get pulled out, sent to the dump, and something nice put in. And what they did over in the Mapleton Park, they have rehabs and mobile homes that look great. 
And uh, Jay, you can jump in. You're the expert who works for the city, but as a planning board member, I've been exposed to this. Uh, the, the, the zoning for mobile home parks, the MH zoning, has very detailed language on how those are manufactured, how they're tied down, and they're very specific to the types of, um, of land use arrangements between those trailer homeowners and the owners of the land, and also the type of uh, construction that's done in those mobile homes. So they're constructed under, and, and there are um, specific standards for mobile home fabrication that are built into the code. So the code just doesn't have any language that accommodates anything other than that right now. Now that doesn't mean that we couldn't update MH, and that might be the kind of thing we would do with an ordinance, or we would just define a new designation, I, I, depending on the need. But it wouldn't be terribly different call it, would it? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> when you write, an, governance. When, when you write an ordinance uh, that goes into law, there's a lot of research that goes into it. It takes, uh, the staff has to do uh, community outreach um, and, uh, you know, really there are steps. <laughs> um, I just wanted to also bring up, in response to the question about, because I'm a real estate agent as well, and um, you know, one thing that I've noticed, because I deal with a lot of different financial levels in uh, the sales all around Boulder County. And I get a lot of people who want to buy a little lot of land up in Boulder County and throw a tiny home on it. And um, I think that there, the, the fear about the wheels is that people are transient. And a lot of people think that the world is still the way it was 20 years ago when you had a job and you worked there for 25 years and then you got your retirement. And that's just not true anymore. And that's why we need to open up the idea of the wheels because, you know, like like you said, you might have to take a job or just do 18-month things here and there. And I think having that's a good option. Sorry. Moving on. <coughs> I guess I'd like to just make one recommendation. It sounds like we're, there's interest in tiny homes on wheels, but also um, other structures on a house. One of the limitations we have is the saturation. 20% uh, saturation of homes can have something in the backyard detached. And that will be a real stumbling block. We don't address that in conjunction with conversations around tiny homes on wheels. So that's, um, I mean, even though this is a housing advisory board, that's one thing that I think we need to start really talking to the planning board, talking to council about. Is there an appetite to start increasing that saturation level? All right, you you get under. No, I have not. So uh, I really appreciate everybody's uh, insight and, and comments on this, and I think uh, what's really imperative, and, and I'd kind of put this out to everybody in the public now, is to move forward on this, what to think about. So you know, we have. I understand your point about code compliance, but I don't think really building code compliance is ever the issue. The issue is how we attain code compliance with the development code, the land use code, the zoning code, and from that perspective, we, we don't have it right now, so how do we get there? <clears throat> Excuse me, and so in that regard, I think where everybody really needs to start thinking about or what kind of things can we do in terms of design standards? What kinds of properties are they, uh, appropriate and what kinds of properties are they not you know there's going to be certain limitations and you got to realize that any sort of any sort of legislative uh, efforts you really have to take into consideration everybody's concerns and even if somebody's concerns regarding property values uh, you know might not be based in in, in fact or in, or in the actual fiscal analysis it's still going to be there and so the best thing that you can do is really um, come up with with uh, concepts that really, kind of address what those concerns may be in terms of design standards, right? So that, you know, this is what the facade's gonna look like on the outside. These are the areas where they're most appropriate in, in a yard, so somewhere where there's screening, somewhere where there's uh, a viable entrance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are the minimum uh, amounts of time that somebody can stay there, you know, so there's somebody's not coming in, staying almost like it's short-term rentals, right? They come in and they stay for a week and then they leave. And so those things are legitimate concerns and, and I think there, it's, it's you know very viable to say we can come up with a structure that can address those things and can really kind of come up with a concept to say this is how and this is why tiny homes on wheels can also work. But I think there's definitely a challenge to try to figure out. 
how that can go about and how that can address some of those other concerns too. And so I put it out to people that know a lot more about this than me, but I just say that's something that I love to hear in terms of where they can go, how we can put them there, how long they should stay there, et cetera. And I think that can really start to make that notion a lot more viable in terms of the whole political process, which is necessary to get to the next step. So. Thank you. Um, I'm sure Jacques is going to thank everyone at the conclusion, but I just also, besides that, wanted to add that if there are some of you who um, are not comfortable talking in a group setting or have more you want to say, you can email us at housingadvisoryboard at bouldercolorado.gov, or you can go uh, onto the city website, Be Heard Boulder, has a section right now where people can make comments about tiny homes, and so you have other options if you didn't get to say everything you want here. Thanks. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Um. As Judy said, I will say thank you. I think Danny wrapped up a lot of what I was going to put into my closing statement here around the kind of just the solutions to put forth if you see them, and that segues into what Judy just said, send them to us. That's really what we're here to try to do, start to get a sense of if we want to do this in Boulder, how can we move forward, what are the most viable pathways, and we need your ideas for that, and that's why we're here tonight. So um, a ton of thanks to all of you for coming out and giving us your stories, giving us your ideas, and uh, helping us try to move forward with it. All right, and we are gonna move to the rest of our business now. Um, we can just leave these chairs right where we are and we're gonna do the boring stuff. But thank you so much, guys. We'll take a break here for board. Brief one, five. <laughs> Guys, I have a quick interruption during this. Hello, hello. If you spoke tonight and you didn't fill out a sheet, would you do that? Kurt? Okay. So if you spoke, just give it to Corey. Thank you. 
Hello, hello, board members, your break is over. <laughs> And again, to the public who spoke, those sheets are up by Corey's table there. You can fill them out. Did you need any? Are we on air yet? We are on air. Adam, thanks for that. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Are you happy? I think it was good. I loved what you said. You could help me really understand. Well, I was like, trying to figure out how I could um, frame it in a way that wouldn't discourage people, good. but um, also give them a sense of the, of the things that need to happen. <laughs> But I think you got to pick I'm so hey there. curious how they tap in. So, do they go on the platform? I'd love to connect with you. So, sure. Something I wanted to share. So, you do have to make an idea. Just not a tiny bit. I agree. I've been part of the Boulder Green Home for twice and buying three times. Mm -hmm. And here I am with right. the real green home. Yeah. <laughs> Preaching to the choir. J. Stugnet. Stugnet, S U G N E T. Mason, I'm trying to get you home on time. I'm excited for having you. You'll find me there, but I do housing policy for the city and have been for like six years. All right, we are going to go ahead and start again. Good me. So, a secondary call to order here. Very cool. And our first piece after the listening session, we have approval of the minutes from January 22nd, 2020. Um, so we'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Can I make the motion? I'm making the motion to approve the minutes from January of 2020. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on the minutes. Mason, can you hear us? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> the minutes from January 22, 2020 are approved unanimously. Thank you. Um, so moving on, matters from the board. Uh, and I'm kind of going to wait for Mason to come back in here because we're going to talk a little bit about our March meeting and so when is it? this when meeting, when is, when is the meeting on homelessness. March 18th. Well, let's just, I, I just want to touch base real quick about clarifying for everybody up here because it has bounced back and forth yeah. and, and apologies from the chair on the, the bounciness. Um, uh, but there was some back and forth on whether we do joint or not. And now it has moved back, if I'm correct, Corey, to the 18th. That is March. correct. Okay. We are going to discuss that, I believe, tonight when it, uh, what, I think that's the next agenda item coming up. So, yes, it did get moved back to the 18th. Okay. Which is the Wednesday. Awesome. Thank you. And then, Brenda, do you have some input on that meeting? Somebody just. Give us what you got. Come on up. Well, it's not fair to put Brenda on the spot here, but. On the spot. No, so I haven't prepared anything specifically about that meeting, um, but I am part of our engagement department, so I am um, here to support engagement for that process. However it is, um, you all need me to support. Okay, great, thanks. I wasn't sure if you had something specific. Yeah. Um, but if you would like her. And we will be talking to you further, I'm sure. 
Uh, Jacques, do you want me to give just a quick overview of what happened? Yeah. Would that be helpful? The record, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I put it in the email. But, so, council had um, an, a, a briefing. Can't tell you the exact date. Um, but they basically um, requested that both Housing Advisory Board and the Human Rights Commission, um, oh, I'm sorry, Human Relations Commission, uh, that both of those boards, that board and the, this board and that commission, that they provide some feedback to council to try to explore what, are there things that we're not currently doing to address homelessness in Boulder, um, new ideas that we have not explored before, or current practices that we could potentially strengthen. Um, and so staff had the great idea, well, hey, this seems like a great opportunity. We'll have a joint board meeting between um, HAB and HRC. Uh, public would have one place to go to visit, uh, and they wouldn't have to go to two, multiple boards to share their ideas. It would save staff time, um, and it would be a good opportunity for the two boards to interact. Uh, we met with the chairs uh, last week, um, and HRC was, the, their chairs were pretty clear that they were not interested in a joint meeting. They said that wasn't the direction they heard from council. Um, and that they have a lot of business uh, to attend to that night, uh, and that uh, basically they felt that they sh that it would, we would be better served by having separate meetings. So all the chairs basically agreed at that meeting that, okay, we'll go back to our original plan. Um, that's why it was kind of abrupt, uh, and so we went back to the meeting on the 18th, uh, and that's kind of where we are today. So we still want to do the type of engagement that you guys talked about way back in January, um, and that's why Brenda is here. Uh, and if there are, and we're happy to talk through some ideas, you know, Brenda and I both went and um, went to a web, uh, lunchtime webinar to talk about the Socratic Circle, which could have been an, could be an opportunity, but um, I think there might be, a, what I heard from the chairs at our last meeting too, that might be a little too soon at the March meeting. Um, so we could potentially revisit that or we could pattern it on the existing, uh, the, what we just saw in terms of the listening session. So, um, and one other piece that I'll plug and then I'll be quiet, um, the, the homeless bus tour um, and is going to be March 12th, so the Thursday before your meeting. So hopefully everybody is already RSVP'd, um, but that'll be a great opportunity. You can interact with HRC members there. Um, learn more about the issue. Uh, I think it, it, it's shaping up to be a really fascinating tour, so if you can make it, I would highly encourage it. So and I can have, answer any other questions you might have. That's it. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna just leave it there with Jay's synopsis of it, and um, we, so we now sit back in the position of having to put together um, that meeting and we had big dreams, I think. There was a lot of excitement around it, so I wanna kind of re-engage with that. And our time frame is shorter now for preparing. Um, we had two volunteers to work on that preparation. Uh, I want to, I think, first just check with the whole board to see if we're still interested in essentially doing the same thing we were discussing initially, and, and if we're good to go back to that. Well, I can say I love the idea, so I was pretty enthused by that whole concept. And uh, the one misgiving that I have now is, and, and I, I leave this more, you know, for other people that know better than me, but is that enough time now? Because we're really looking at, you know, three weeks, right? Um, and enough time to get that, and, you know, we kind of talked about ways that we were going to try to generate turnout and make sure that we had ample turnout. and. Um, even, you know, providing meals, even, you know, contributing to that and stuff like that. And I was down with all that stuff. And I just, I, I, I really um, love to see that done right would be my thing. And I don't know if three weeks is more than enough time, not enough time, but that would be my big concern. <laughs> oh, that's nice. That's other people. That's a no. That's great points. Um, so here's what we were thinking because the date was moving around. So we were like, where are we going? We're coming, going. So there was just some finagling with that. 
Um, I approached uh, the, so what we thought about whether or not we'd get people here, and in lieu of getting people here, we go to them. Um, it's a vulnerable population, we should be going to them, and so I'm, I'm gonna space on her name, over at the Bridge House at the Emergency Center on 30th Street. Uh, Isabel? Isabel, um, sorry, Isabel. Um, has uh, offered us potentially to go there. So we can go there, um, provide food, uh, have the same kind of a listening setup. That way they don't have to come to us. Plus, um, Brenda brought up a good point tonight is that for them to get into the shelter or to get into the services, they have to be over there. So if they come here, they're missing out on their shelter for the night. So us going there is appropriate. Um, and uh, yeah, it's totally enough time. Um, a majority of the individuals there ha have been engaged on our social media and we've already, since the last meeting, um, hit all of the emergency Slack groups and uh, the unhoused groups. So they're prepared and know that we're doing this. They're just waiting to hear from us when we finally land yeah, on a date. Okay. So I have a couple questions. One is, what is the capacity there? the uh, room capacity. I'll find out. And my other question is, um, since council wants us to find out um, new ideas, strategies, and tools for the unhoused, um, I imagine besides people who are unhoused being there, you want us to invite other people in the community too. Is that correct? That's what I talked with uh, Elizabeth about. Elizabeth? I'm sorry. Isabel. Isabel. Oh, Isabel. So there is capacity for both the people who are normal. We're going to talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so so then I want to say that uh, I had agreed to do the part about engagement still. Mm -hmm. And so how does everyone feel, even though the details are not down yet, I have a list of about 20 or 30 places that I could send out a simple save the date to, so until, you know that it will be March 18th at 6 o'clock, and, and we'll let them know again once the date is, but to save that date. And does everyone Sounds great. feel okay? I would just do two or three sentences. Uh, you mm -hmm. know. So is everyone just trusting me that those sentences will be appropriate? Mm -hmm. You can do that. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> um, I'll talk with Isabel um, and find out about the room capacity. We kicked around a couple of whether it'd be at, go ahead, Brenda. I know you're, you want to chime in? Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that we found successful in engagement with vulnerable populations is to let the folks who work with those populations co-create yes. that event with us. Um, so it's possible that a Wednesday at six o'clock at Severe Weather Shelter might be a rough time for them to be doing anything other than housing people who have come to Severe Weather mm -hmm. Shelter and providing the services for the folks who are there. So it, Isabel seemed amenable she, to it at that time. Yeah, I mean, great. I didn't know how specific you were with her about yeah. the time of day that it might be and how many people might show up. We have a call sh so, scheduled, so we can actually yeah. add in. I didn't think about the room capacity piece. Yeah, so I would just additional questions. Yeah, confirm with her that that's a good time for mm -hmm. the folks who are there and any folks who might be coming from outside of there to be in the space. Yeah, and it brings up a good point, which Terry and I were talking about too, is that to create create some ease if the first half hour is that it's a buffet that we're all having food and sitting and breaking bread together before we go into a listening session to, to um, have that be more of a um, welcoming experience. I believe they serve um, community dinner there from 4.30 to 6 every okay. weeknight. Good to know. Um, so that could be the beginning of the session Okay, as you all come and have dinner. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I was wondering if our timing of six o'clock is actually appropriate for that. Yeah, Isabel. So yeah, yeah so Mason, you'll you'll her. dig into that. How we have are a we meeting scheduled as, for when this is once we had the date? So right. I just so the, make sure. yeah. So the the one piece I just want to roll over real quick is for members of the board. Do we have some flexibility? Can everybody have some flexibility on that <coughs> time? Uh, I'll make sure too, as long as we know, as long as it's that date. Well, yeah, yeah. And that's, <laughs> it's that date, right? It's, it's, about, yeah. it, it's that date, and yeah. we could be a few hours before yeah. the stated time. And, and you know, I think as it's a rolling thing too, we could, you know, we could start the thing. As you said, it's going to be kind of a 
a hangout time initially, and then we'll get into the listening session. So I think if somebody rolled in late, that would also work fine probably, right? I also have another question, and Corey, maybe you can answer this, because um, obviously we won't have it on video, but we'll be recording it. But is there a way that we, like, are these microphones only work here, or is there something we can do so people can hear the speakers? No, we don't have the capacity to do something like that. We don't have the equipment necessary. The only thing that I have is the small recording device, and so, you know, I don't have a microphone either. Um, so if we're in a very large space and people are not loud speakers and we don't have them close enough to the microphone, it may not record everything, but that's pretty much all the equipment we have. So that's we, something we'll have to consider. Yeah. Corey, when we, we use the off-site locations and we have that little thing in the center of the table and we have mics up, can we do the same thing? What do you mean mics up? Well, um, they're the table top, like we just used out there. No, this is tied to the city's to the Oh, you're chambers. talking about camera for the, yes, yeah, sorry. This sorry, is sorry, tied, sorry. these portable mics are tied to this sound system in chambers and it's not something that we can just take with us. It's what, built into the Is it possible walls. that we can get like, what do people do? Like, rent a little microphone or yeah. use a microphone or something? I mean, don't we need... Are you worried about people not being heard? Is that the issue? Not, not being heard, it not being tape recorded, and then... Well, it will be recorded. That. Like but I said, I have this, the, the, the recorder, and it does have the ability to pick up sound so long as people are close enough to it and speak up. We can look into renting equipment, but that could get really pricey. Yeah. I'm just letting you guys know, because this is going to... Uh, come out of your budget for the year, and it could cost upwards of $500 to rent equipment for the day. Yeah, what, what are we doing when we were at Spruce? Uh, when was right. that? It was a small enough space that the, the, table micro, the table recorder was able to capture. And we just everything. talk loud. Right, you just but talk loud and it was able to pick everything up. But if we're talking about a mess, listening session like tonight, yeah. I could prop it up in the center, but it, there's no guarantee that it'll capture everything, so that's just something to consider. I, th I think shall we, shall we just suggest initially that we're gonna use our existing means, yeah. but let's just put it out here. Somebody in this room knows somebody who does sound in some way, shape, or form, and maybe we can get something that could record and serve the purpose. So if anybody's got anybody in their back pocket who might know that, let's just put it out there and see if we can get something better so that we can effectively record those voices. I mean, it'd be nice to have recorded voices for the meeting that's that's effective. In a way, it feels bad to me to say, we're doing this other type of meeting and because, you know, this population that we want to hear, we're not going to hear. Some of them may not, may not want, want to be, be recorded, so I, I think it might yeah. be important to make that optional mm -hmm. for people, to, that people can right. ask to have the recorder turned off. So that might be, or, or say if you really want to be heard, right. like loud. Exactly. Yeah. I, it could so, go either way. Yep. I, I have a, a wonky just point to bring up. Can't help it with everything. But uh, so we probably, <laughs> if we're all there at 4.30 or something, Right for open meetings act for the sunshine law, we're gonna need to just notice it for then, because yeah. we'll yeah. have quorum. So right, we'll notice, yeah. Yeah. I will say one benefit about going to that community dinner is that some of the folks who have not been able to access services through coordinated entry can come and have that dinner. It's open to the public, so you may be able to meet with some people who the current services now are not necessarily good pathways for them. And I just want to clear up, it wasn't Isabel that I was talking to. I just checked my notes. I was, I'm speaking with Melissa. <laughs> so I'm like, this doesn't but, sound yeah. right. I'm like, why is this? <laughs> yeah, okay, so Melissa's who I'm Isabel's working with. Isabel's the CEO of the Bridge House. Oh, okay, because I'm like, that doesn't sound right. Okay, Isabel. <laughs> no, or the sorry. executive director, I should say. Okay, let's, uh, Judy, go ahead. So when we were at this meeting with um, the Human Relations Commission, um, Jock mentioned something that I thought was a really good idea. Um, while we're looking for tools um, and new ideas and new strategies to help uh, for people who are unhoused, he suggested we confine it to housing. And so we not um, veer off into areas where we don't have expertise or learning, like more mental health services or more alcohol rehab services or whatever, that we confine it to ideas about housing. So I just wanted to have us all talk about that. 
I think I, I want to revisit that comment because I do think that this format that we're putting back together here, um, I might I, I would pull back on that okay. a little bit cool. because I don't know how viable that is to say, hey, everybody, we want to hear about it, but we only want to hear about this from you. So I think it's probably it's okay. it's going to be a broader discussion. We may be able to give that as a prompt and say, hey, what what works for you? as interim structures that we can put okay. together that we haven't thought about that, you know, and we can maybe give it some direction, but I'm sure it's going to, we're going to hear many different perspectives on many different things. So do we, do we want to have some questions, maybe some, well, you know what I mean? So it frames the discussion a little bit. Yeah, I, I actually had a question about that. Um, uh, was the ask from the council, uh, did that come with just this general question or did, was there going to be a presentation from staff on, uh, ideas that then the boards would comment on because generally the that's the format we always get when we're asked to comment on something is that there'll be a set of proposals from staff but if, if this is specifically an open-ended question then it sounds like this format will work but I just want to make sure that um, there wasn't something also yeah. in terms of some very specific stuff they were asking for let me let me turn that to Jay real quick and just so the in council, when they made the request, it was a very generic request. Um, but staff has been talking about it, and one option, and you guys can tell me what you think about this, there are several council members who have floated specific ideas, right? So maybe we address those as part of the staff presentation, um, and that sort of gives you something to kind of react to. Um, but the idea is we didn't want to limit it to just a few suggestions. It, the idea is if there's something new that we haven't considered before, we definitely want to explore that. And, and but I, I think that just to be clear, what council asked for is, you know, we don't want a list of 50 things. We would like, you know, a handful or less of topics that we can ask um, staff to go back and do some additional work on. Uh, two questions. One, you just said the staff presentation. You're not expecting that, us to get over there and you're going to present something before the dinner, right? What are you talking about the staff, staff presentation to us? Go ahead. You, you did say presentation, didn't did, you? No. No. I think if the word presentation was used, I thought maybe you were just talking about when you when the request was made or so. No, uh, so yeah. same as the joint meeting, what staff would propose is that you would have a listening session, but it's the same format, right? So staff, our homelessness person would go through and explain, we have a homeless strategy. It was adopted in 2018. Mm, uh, got it, so you start the meeting is what you're saying. Yeah, okay. just to provide that context and sort of a, you know, a basis of information. Um, so. But I'm thinking, we're thinking that's like 15, 20 minutes tops. Tops, yeah. Even less. Tops. And you're going to learn more from the tour, too. A lot of that's going to get covered on the tour. But for the people in the audience to understand what it is we're currently doing, I think it's important content. I think it's, I just, I, I think it's worth having maybe a discussion briefly about that um, and just how much time that would be and the purpose of it and the value of it. And I see Brenda yeah. thinking about it over there also. So... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, my thing, it, I want some clarity too around, <clears throat> because there's been some things that have happened behind closed doors between you and council or some, somebody else, because you keep referring. All I n know about is when we were at retreat for the work plan, where that came from with the HRC and um, us working on this was specifically Adam and Rachel had p um, pitched the unhoused comprehensive plan that was going to pick up any unintended and intended consequences that have happened from coordinated entry. And they pitched a, a package of um, services for it. And council was like, can't put it on the work plan. It's got a lot going on. How about we discuss it in April? And that's when Rachel suggested that HAB and um, HRC pick it up and do the legwork with people beforehand and give recommendations back. So for what I heard was that around the services that they're pitching um, as fillers for what the coordinated entry is missing, these were possible options. And then the question became, 
we have individuals with lived experience that are not at the table. So we're, we're here reigning without drawing lived experience to the table and asking them for their input on a, court, on a, uh, a comprehensive unhoused plan. And so it sounds like there's been discussion with council since then, and I'm curious, because um, you were like, don't bring back 50, bring back, and I was like, I think there's already stuff on the table, is there not? There are stuff on the table, so I don't think what you just described is inconsistent with what I was describing. Um, I think what I understood, and I, I wasn't at the retreat, so I don't know exactly what everyone said, but I thought there was a, what I, my understanding, there is a component of are there new ideas? It wasn't just a reaction to what Adam and Rachel have thrown out there. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah I, I think it was just the new, what they, there was new ideas in their comprehensive plan. Yeah, and I think this is, this is what, partially what sank the joint meeting was there just wasn't clarity on what the ask was. Mm -hmm. And, and a, the HRC was concerned that we were blowing something wide open and, and readdressing their entire strategy. Um, and there was discomfort there. So I think one thing that I'm thinking about with this is we're going to get, as you said, I think if I'm hearing what Mason's saying, this kind of let's glean some new, especially for the entry coordinated entry, let's glean where, where we're missing, what are some things we can do to, to close those gaps. And is that is that correct? Was that part of that? Do you have the uh, what they proposed? Do you have what was presented to everybody on council? The unhoused plan that Adam and Rachel presented? I do not have that in front. Okay, so it's got, um, there's probably five different things in there with some general services that are being asked for. Jake. It's not, it wasn't made up. I mean, it's, it, that's what I'm saying is like there was right. clarity around it. Um, I think there was a fuzz on how are we moving this forward in. Right. So maybe what would be helpful, Jay, is if you, you have access to that, can we see it? Um, yes. So that'll if be you could, part of your memo. That'll be part of the memo. Great. We'll get a memo on this from Vicki. Excellent. Um, at least a week before. Okay. So, if there's any way to get that sooner than a week before, I have it. I can send it. You have it. Yeah. Let's oh, just yeah, get it. Just let's get it into our hands. I think as soon as we can, so that we can look at that. So, my understanding from from I went back and listened to our meeting when Kristen presented what mm -hmm. council had requested, and the memo that you wrote to all of us about it. And I thought that our task was pretty clear, and that we're supposed to um, invite public participation to learn new ideas, tools, and strategies um, um, to help um, for people who are unhoused. And my thought was that council was looking to make sure that everything was covered and they had all the new input and that, and that as you said, it, I mean, council members have told me that when, <laughs> that when we present them with 40 or 50 ideas, they're not going to pay much attention, but when we present them with four or five, they're going to look at it more seriously. So if we can hear what everyone thinks are new ideas, and we'll hear a lot of things that aren't new ideas, um, but that we, then it, then our job would be to call that down um, to a few ideas to present to council. That's what I thought we were supposed to do. Not what I heard, but but, but and this is this is exactly where we are. We just don't well, I was in the meeting. Right. No, I know. In this, I know, I know. But when we all sat down at the table, there was not consensus. Or yeah. Every, so. Um, I'm. I, I'm feeling like where this meeting is going to go is <laughs> is that we're going to have a lot of input, probably a broad range of things. And I think our role as HAB is to do just that, is to glean. Um, and I would, I would argue that we put a lens on it of housing. In other words, things that we are engaged with was how do we provide these things, but we don't necessarily limit it to that. In other words, if we're if we hear something out there that's an idea that has nothing to do with housing and it has to do with services, or then we'll pull that in as well. Um, you know, but our strongest recommendation is likely going to be around things that right. have to do with with housing. 
think we, we try so. to come up with a set of recommendations that are and related to housing, and then we can have tangential recommendations. We can, exactly. Right. If there's anything really salient that comes up, you know, that's outside yeah. of our wheelhouse, but it's really a good point. But it's a good point. We're going to bring it forth. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Totally. Br Brenda, is there a way on Be Heard Boulder to bring up, um, a, just like with tiny houses, do uh, the comment piece for unhoused so that um, because I'm a part of a couple of uh, private groups for unhoused individuals, and it'd be great if they could write in if they don't can't, can't attend or aren't attending. Yeah, we can certainly put something up on Be Her Boulder. Um, also, I was talking with Lyndall um, Ellison, who is the resident services manager at the Lee Hill Permanent Supportive Housing site, mm -hmm. which is folks who are just on the other side of homelessness. And she said if you if we could send her a worksheet that had the questions on it, she could distribute it to her residents. She said it's hard for them to get out in the evenings usually, but she'd be happy to collect answers to those things. Mm -hmm. So if we come up with mm -hmm. three or five prompt questions, um, there are lots of different ways we can distribute that. Um, while I stood up, I'm thinking about sort of the business portions of the meeting when it came up with the presentation. I'm just trying to picture that at, at Bridge House, how we're doing a presentation and then how a discussion like this is happening after the meeting while in the middle of severe weather shelter. The time I was there, I believe they used the whole building mm -hmm. for beds. Um, and so just asking um, Melissa what, what those capabilities are. It's also hard to have a culling conversation in front of very vulnerable sure. folks no, who've just I've given you all of their stories. And then to say, well, this piece is important and this piece is less important um, will, might, might land rough on right. those folks. So I think we want to be really thoughtful about how the business meeting happens within the context of the listening session. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't think we'd be having a business <laughs> meeting there, would we? Well, no. I, I, think that the, I think the question is, I think the question there is, um, and you bring a good point, we don't have time. Right. Between Only that meeting, piece. there's no second meeting. We don't have another meeting to say these are the pieces that we're going to put together and deliver to council. So in some way, shape, or form, we have to wrap it up in that meeting unless we have another meeting that we call and notice and... Can we go to a bar? Yeah. I, I don't know, Jay. <laughs> if, we, if we notice it, we can. It. <laughs> Maybe not a bar. <laughs> And well, something interesting, I'm just going to throw this out there. If we meet from, say we meet earlier and we're doing like a 4.30, 5.30, 6 o'clock or something, and we do there, the roadhouse across the way has a private conference room on the lower level of it. So we could adjourn for 15 minutes, go across to the roadhouse, and use the conference room and downstairs and finish up our meeting. Yeah. Meeting. A public noticed As a, yeah, um, of course. open meeting. Every, just so that we're clear, everything's public noticed. Yes. yes. And the public is welcome. I think, yeah. I think that's good, because I, 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 yeah, we don't want to do it there, yeah. you know, with everybody there. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's still worth the question to Bridge House and say, hey, is there a room that isn't in use that we could step out? And the, there's, uh, yeah, I like there's the a roadhouse. possibility, depending, it's also March. Um, and, and one thing, too, that I just am thinking ahead about logistics, um, if we do have a staff person come in to do a brief presentation, um, like what Jay suggested about the homelessness strategy and whatever, uh, do they have the capability for us to be able to set up a computer and have a screen and all of the other things that come along with a presentation. I would personally not go that route. I would say that Jay could give a five minute recap on where we're at with the coordinated entry or something like that if you're comfortable with it. But Wires, like little? Maybe paper, yeah. yeah. Or maybe it's a dry erase board and a flip board. <laughs> right, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of something, something a little more kind of human. Low key. human. Yeah. Something low key. Um, Vicki did a, did a 10 minute version of what she did for council at a meeting we had with Boulder Junction neighbors recently. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's something more like that. Just with no, she didn't have a no PowerPoint, PowerPoint or anything. She just mm -hmm. shared the things that we did, that okay. they had been working on and the results they've seen. And she has a really nice handout that she's been working and, on for the tour. And she has that. Yeah. yeah. So that's it explains the different steps in the I, process. It, I think, yeah. you know, albeit brief, but a, uh, uh, 
having staff kind of lay out what's out there first, because a lot of people might not even know, and so it's really important right. to get that out to them and say these are out there for you, especially if we're going to ask them, what are we missing, right? They're going to be like, well, what do you have, right? And so <laughs> and what I think that is really are. important, right? Those yeah. things. Right. Yeah, you know, and then a handout where they're like looking at that and they can see it, and mm -hmm. and then good feedback. I think is great. So, are we going to ask Vicky to participate yeah. in that? Then no, I mean, she yeah. will. Great. She's planning on yeah, it. Yeah, she's planning on it. Great. She's flexible. How you, you know, it's really up to you to decide what that what that looks like. Uh, I have another question. So, I have not seen the space there, Brenda. You have. Seen the space? I have, yeah. So I, I just want to make sure that we're not having the meeting at a time when the people who are staying there, that that's their space and we're preventing them from yeah. <laughs> laying out their mattresses and stuff like that that's while the we're question. there. Is that? Yeah. That's the question to Melissa. They have dinner from 4.30 to 6. Um, I'm not sure what time the beds go down. The beds are all cots that are sort of up against the wall. Um, there's two spaces. One side is for the folks who are in the Path to Home program, and the other side is severe weather shelter. Um, so it, it'll be a good question for Melissa <coughs> as far as okay. um, how the logistics of that work. So Mason, you're going to be on that, right, to mm -hmm. deal with the logistics? And okay, just great. to keep in mind, um, the sooner we can confirm space, the better, because I do have to at least mm -hmm. put advance so, notice yeah. in the paper for mm -hmm. these meetings um, and pin down the exact locations and approximate times so that I can put out the proper notices for these meetings. But I will need to know at Date. least by the next chair's meeting. I promise. The to very have. latest. Something to you by the end of Friday. Perfect. And if, Thank and you. if it doesn't work, I, I'm totally fine with saying let's kind of bill on it and try again. You know, I mean, if the if the logistics just don't work or whatever for right. So then if I'll have to just a bad weather finding, day. Then right. we'll need to decide if we're going to be looking for another space. Days. Is that going to be you guys? So, or is that going to be staff? Um, here's my sense yeah. of urgency on this. Um, we're losing the shelter in the spring, the the emergency shelter in the spring. We've got massive issues on the unhoused. We've got sweeps going on. I personally have a sense of urgency around not postponing these things just because we have beds to go home to and this is urgent for, I mean, I was kind of shocked about the seven, 800 vets on our streets. Um, so I I think this is absolutely doable. This is kind of a, and I, and I'm, yeah. I'm great with it. I'm just saying like if. Yeah, if, we'll figure it out. If we're, I actually rent a think tent. it's. Yeah. I think it's emergency, too, be, also because we can't, this is the first time council's asked, specifically asked anything of us, and if we don't get it done then, we won't be able to deliver. Yeah. So the issue is, you know, if you find out the place um, isn't right because it'll prevent people from putting out their cots or being comfortable, then I'm sure you can find another place. That's what I just said. Yep. Lee, Hill, um, Lee Hill Permanent Supportive Housing has a lovely lobby area that I'm sure they would be happy um, to let us use. Oh, really? Okay. I can't promise, but yeah. um, but I, I think they would probably welcome a conversation in their in their residence. Okay. Um, and sign, sign, sorry, finally, as a, as a very last backup, pretty much all of the city spaces are booked that night. Um, but the senior center, sorry, the Aging oh. Well West Eight. is available. Okay. Oh. Right. Um, we would have to pay for somebody to be there, um, a temp, but it's, you know, Fairly low minor. So um, there's a lot of pieces on the plate. Mason, you kind of are point, it seems like. Do you need someone else working with you on aspects of it or or just no, thank you. Okay. <laughs> let us let us know if you do, if you need anything from anybody. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we're gonna end that. Thank you, Brenda. And yeah, and I appreciate that we spent we spent a little bit of extra time on that, but I think we needed to pull it back together. So, thank you for that. Um, HAB retreat planning. We were going to talk about what we're going to do at our retreat because this is the meeting that we have to do that. So, there's. Um, there's two things. I, I didn't look up, when I looked up at board and commissions today, I didn't see, I didn't see when people are, um, 
uh, sworn in as being our new people. Are they already, will that already be done by the time we have the retreat? Pardon? Yes. Yeah, okay. The April 1. So didn't you send something out that said if anyone had any specific things they want to talk about? So all Jacques and I need to know right now is if in the next couple of days anybody does have certain topics they want to talk about to let us know and then we can go ahead and plan and we'll meet with the um, the woman who's going to be the facilitator. Right. And so we don't have to talk about it. Not, not tremendously, but yeah, I just wanted to yeah. sit in and I didn't, I don't know that I received anything from anyone on that as far as well, topics so we we'll got in this week yeah if you if you have something yeah get it into us okay we have a new member and a facilitator right correct so that's yeah yeah all right i i got an interview next week so i guess yeah. <laughs> why not be here oh, oh, that's good. Right. i'm glad that's to right. hear right. i was going to ask you if you were going again yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right good um okay i think i think item c uh we don't have anything on well i do have or you do have some on on what? On tonight's meeting, I will uh, listen to the uh, to it on television and write up a report mm -hmm. um, about it, like I do, and submit it just to have ahead of time. Um, I mean, you know, submit it to everyone for, for their changes. Yeah, standard standard process on that, um, and then. D is in there, we're not gonna have any new business. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> There's one thing, Are, yes. aren't we gonna talk about what what did transpire tonight, if there are any issues that are important to us? Or is that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just debrief Okay. Okay. with that. Um, so that wraps up matters from the board, matters from staff, addressing homelessness bus tour. We've already kind of been there. Uh, I actually have a question about it. I'm really curious how you handle, how we're doing this. Like, I mean, it feels really weird. It feels like we're, what, what are we doing? What? I mean, what, so we're touring. The topic is literally addressing homeless bus tour. Are we going where they're sweeping? Or, I, mean, I just, I can't wrap my brain around this. What does this look like? Uh, did you look at the stops that we listed? He, yes, and okay. And to me, if were we just walking through the buildings and staring we're at go, going to the courthouse, uh, Judge Cook will give I don't know 10, 15 minute overview uh, about how she sees homelessness in her courtroom and the tools that she has at her disposal. Um, she's providing free coffee at 8.45. So oh, so I didn't get this agenda. I, uh, yeah, I didn't see this detail of going into the judge. So, okay, yeah. keep going. This makes more sense. Um, the next stop will, is um, the homeless shelter. So basically, um, you'll go in. And has an, has, have people been in the homeless shelter before? I mean, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's beautiful. Oh, I'm sorry. No, start. we, we start with coordinated entry. Um, is the next stop and with the severe weather shelter next door um, they'll talk about sort of the three services that are provided there um, then they go to the homeless shelter um, uh, Greg Harms will give sort of a 10 minute overview typically talking about you know who they serve um, and you know how the how it operates you'll see sort of the men's side the women's side um, the lunchroom it's ever going to be a very quick tour through and then we haven't quite figured out if you're going to go into Lee Hill um, or if we're just going to walk by it, but just basically try to show that continuum. So from, you know, being in the, you know, some people, their first experience with uh, our system is through the courts. And then the next step is through coordinated entry or the severe weather shelter. And next it's the homeless shelter. And then it's uh, uh, transitional or permanent supportive housing, transitional housing. So we're trying to show the continuum. Okay. And ideally, we would show someone fully housed at the end, but that's been a little challenging. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's not what I thought it was going to be. Oh, okay. was... It felt really weird to me, too, until I wrote <clears throat> I, I, just, I missed that on the event rate. I didn't see the that. scheduling on that. Okay, so we good on that? Yes. All right. Um, great. Welcome back, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> knew you couldn't stay away um, from the exciting stuff uh, so we have just debrief now um, on the listening session and uh, 
Anybody have any comments for debrief? Mark, I think what you're doing is awesome. I, I, uh, I almost want to take a trip to Kansas City to see it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I hope we can do something around here like that sooner rather than later, because I think it's just great. Um, I'll leave it at that. Any other comments? So I guess my question is, we had this really good productive meeting, and I hope we have a little discussion about what we should do about it then. Do we actually want to write something up that we give to council that would just be three or four? I mean, it seemed like three different things emerged as being possibilities to maybe move the needle a little farther along, and one would be perhaps lightening things up about um, tiny homes on wheels. Um, and one would be perhaps two different types of pilot projects, one where maybe tiny homes with wheels could rent space or something, and one would be a project like, like Mark's that had tiny homes um, maybe in an area that was um, partially industrial, so it, would, so it would be easier to accomplish perhaps, that had, um, that had some case management right there or service assistance or whatever the right word is. Um, you know, and do we want to do anything or do we want to just let this evaporate? Uh, I think my, my thought on that is, um, for me, this is going to be an item that I'm going to put into our retreat. Um, I think that anything that we do put forth needs to be well thought out and put together. So it's not something from my perspective that I think that we want to just say, hey, you know, we had this listening session, here's what we heard. But I think I'd, I'd like to see us engage with it, put some backbone to it, and then, and then move it forward. I absolutely agree. I think that's the best way to go about it. I think there's very, um, there's some very loaded issues there, particularly once we're referring that to town council, you know, particularly with that regulatory side and stuff like that. And I think there was some strong sentiment that we heard today that, you know, we can relay in the best way, but it'll probably be a good retreat thing to we'll talk about how we convey those things. And maybe that can underscore a, a broader retreat issue, which is, you know, we're going to have all these listening sessions, and we'll have another significant one under our belts by the time we do that retreat, or you guys do the retreat, whatever. But uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> but at that, you know, at that point in time, I think, uh, you know, have a good idea of saying, here's how we're going to kind of um, decompress the listen, listen session and then relay that information from that point forward, right? Yeah. You know, because I think there's some process for that and, and probably, you know, doing it on the fly is probably not the best thing. Time. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else be brief? Okay. Um, that said, I will adjourn the HAB regular meeting for February 25th, 2020. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, it's like, you know. I think this guy's awesome. Oh, yeah. Mark, many thanks. Mark, where do you for get the money for all of it? Thank you so much. They're really good at corporate. They have raising Live from Paris, on France 24.